This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Good morning, members. Uh, we have a quorum. Uh, can I call the meeting to order? And could I ask Broadcasting to lift the members present into the spotlight, please?
Good morning, members. Uh, just check that all members online can hear me. Okay, if you would like to nod, just to indicate you can hear. Great. Uh, I would advise members that the chair and deputy chair are unable to be present in person this morning. Therefore, we need to formally elect someone to chair the meeting. Uh, do I have any proposals for a member to take the chair? Happy to propose um, our colleague. Paul Raja, sorry. Thank you. Uh, do you have any other nominations, members? No. Is the member content to accept the nomination? Thank you. Can I ask uh, Ms Bradshaw to take the chair, please? Sorry, Paul, I took a brain freeze there. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I omitted to seek a seconder there for that nomination. Have a second. I second that. Thank you, Pam. Okay, good morning, members. Um, before I start, can I pass on my sympathies to our um, chairperson, Colin Gillard, who's had a, a, a bereavement, and um, just want to send our best wishes from the committee. Um, so this morning, um, we have some members joining by Starleaf, and they are um, Pam Cameron, Pat Sheehan, and Orlea Flynn. Um, can I remind members about the protocol re uh, regarding the use of electronic devices? Chair. Yes. Chair, sorry, Paula, can I just come in here at this point? Sure thing. Go ahead, Pam. Just, just to say, um, I also want to express my condolences to Colm and his wife, Annie, on the loss um, of her father um, this week, and also to express um, the very same condolences to yourself and to your husband, Ian, on, on the loss of your father-in-law. I think it's a, it's a difficult week for you. Also, I really appreciate that you're able to stand on this chair. Thank, 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 you, thank you for that. Thank you very much. I'll pass that on, Pam. Thank you. Okay, um, so, so the, the Chair has sent his apologies. Um, are members aware of any other apologies? Okay, so the next item would be chair bus uh, Chairperson's business, but as the Chair's not here, we'll, we, we'll, we'll move on. Um, have we got the um, Minister and the Chief Medical Officer on Starleaf? certainly have the Minister. I'm not sure whether the CMO is with him or... Joining separately. Um, Minister, can you hear the meeting? I can, Chair, yeah. yeah. Um, good morning, Minister. Michael should be joining shortly. Okay, well, will we push on with the. Okay, Minister, if you could give us just a couple of minutes, we'll just go through some procedures here while the, the Chief Medical Officer joins us. Okay, so um, moving on to item three then, members, um, the draft minutes. There are four sets of draft minutes to approve. And I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 15th of December, which are at tab 3.1 of the meeting pack. Are members content with these minutes? Okay. Um, I'll move quickly on then. Um, the refer members then. I didn't see any. Uh, everybody's content? Yes. Um, refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 17th of December at tab 3.2. Are members content with these minutes? Yes, content. <laughs> um, content. Uh, refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 22nd of December at tab 3.3. Are members content with these minutes? Content, yes. And then I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 6th of January at tab 3.4. Are members content with these? Agreed. Okay. Okay, so there are no matters arising from these minutes, so we're going to move on now to um, our main agenda item today, which is the ministerial update on the COVID-19 disease response. Um, Minister, you're very welcome, as is the Chief Medical Officer, and um, I uh, welcome you here. And if you're uh, ready, we would invite you to brief the committee. Thank you. Okay, Chair. Um, and, and Chair, first of all, can I just join in with uh, the expressions of, of sympathy and condolences were passed on to your, your own family after that? The chair of the committee called me on me as well, so it will be a, a very trying time. Um, but uh, again, can I thank you for the opportunity to update um, the committee? I, I will keep my opening remarks short uh, to allow you for more time for questions as, as we did the last time a few weeks ago. Um, but unfortunately, we are all too aware that this situation we currently face remains uh, far from good. Uh, since my last on the, the 22nd of December. Uh, they, I see that. It's not even looking at me. Right, so if I sit here, they're going to see me. Oh, I, I think there's a, an issue with the sound, Minister. Would, would you try again? Hi. It's the Chief Medical Morning, Officer. Um, Come on. 
Is it possible, Chief Medical Officer, have you got your um, your microphone on mute? Uh, technology. Minister, would you like to continue? Yeah, sure. I'm ready to go again. You know, I think what I was saying in the chair was, you know, since my last briefing on the, the 22nd of December, the, the executive took the difficult decision to impose um, those further restrictions on all of us in an attempt to to stem the rising number of positive cases. Um, and thankfully, what we have seen in the last few days, there is some evidence to suggest that the restrictions are having a positive impact. The, the R rate has fallen quite significantly. And I remain optimistic that the continued compliance with the current restrictions will see this fall further. Uh, the Chief Scientific Advisor has indicated that we have passed the, the peak in terms of new cases of COVID-19 um, for this way above the pandemic. Um, but that is for cases only. It's not for hospitalizations and sadly nor will it be for deaths. Um, you, you are undoubtedly aware of the significant pressures our health and social care trusts are, are facing. And whilst in, in November our trusts actually again exceeded their planned levels of, of rebuilding activity, um, where they are actually with an additional 28,000 outpatient appointments and 16,500 additional diagnostic tests, for instance. Sadly, when the numbers are, are confirmed for the six weeks since, I, I suspect we will see a very different picture. Um, in my written um, update and statement to the House um, last Friday evening, I announced uh, the new regional approach to the prioritisation of surgeries uh, in light of recent decisions by our trust to, unfortunately and challenging, we have to downturn a lack of activity. Uh, and I've made it clear that I want to see every bit of spare capacity, um, both within our health and social care system and our independent providers used. Um, that may well mean asking people to travel further for treatment, but better than that, I believe, than, have to, than having to wait. There, there was a regional meeting earlier this week uh, with all the key stakeholders fully brought into the model. Um, I hope it will allow us to deliver some of the most urgent surgeries quickly. But the next few weeks, we'll see sustained pressure on, on our healthcare system. There is some light um, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, members will be fully aware of the COVID-19 um, vaccination program, which started on the 8th of December, is making good and steady progress. Uh, I want to pay tribute to all those staff who, who have made this happen. Um, from those who have ensured an, uh, an efficient vaccine distribution system to the pharmacy staff um, who work tirelessly behind the scenes and to the vaccinators on the front line uh, administering the vaccine. Because this has been and um, continues to be a huge um, logistical challenge, but one that we are, we are well placed to deliver over the coming weeks and months ahead. Um, as of close of play on, on Tuesday, um, 91,419 individuals um, have been vaccinated in Northern Ireland. The programme uh, here to date uh, has been focused on the number one priority group uh, as recommended by JCBI. That's those care home residents uh, and staff. And I'm very pleased to say that, that we have been leading the way in vaccinating this group by putting in place teams and pharmacy arrangements that have enabled all care homes, not an outbreak, uh, to be vaccinated by the 31st of December. Um, Chair, 458 out of a total of 483 care homes have been vaccinated over, and over two thirds uh, have received the, their second dose. And the rest I hope to see completed uh, very shortly, as soon as those outbreak risk assessment restrictions actually allow us to do that. The, the vaccination of our frontline and our health and social care workers is also well underway at trust at our trust and regional vaccination sites and additional staff groups from the wider health and social care family, such as our community pharmacy, uh, dentistry, independent domiciliary care workers um, have been given access to these sites and will be over the next few weeks. The, the GP element of the programme, as members know, went live on 4th of January um, with a, a small number of practices starting by vaccinating their patients aged 80 years and over. Um, all practices will now have started the vaccination of their patients aged 80 years and over from Monday, 
And while some received only 100 doses, they will get more next week and more again the week after that. As soon as we're getting the vaccine centrally, uh, we're getting it out to, to the practices. So looking forward and, and actually based on, uh, on the vaccine that should be available uh, by late January and throughout February, um, I'm confident we will see rapid progress through those first four groups recommended by JCBI for vaccination. Um, and that's the you know, care home residents and staff, the over 80s or health and social care workers, uh, those aged 70 years and over, as well as those who are classified as clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we all, um, even those fortunate enough um, to have been vaccinated, need to ensure we strictly abide by the current restrictions uh, to help ensure we limit the spread of COVID-19. And it will, um, it will probably be early spring before we see um, the effects of the vaccine, the effects of the vaccination program. Um, and until then, we need to do all that we can uh, to protect ourselves, protect our loved ones, uh, protect wider society, and protect the health service. Um, under this um, critical juncture, I believe there, there is still no room um, for complacency. So, Chair, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, members' questions or, or comments. Um, thank you very much, um, Minister. Um, can I just confirm, uh, uh, have you been away for quarter to 11? I think we've lost the Minister. We have just a few technical problems this morning. We'll just try and get him back online. You're, you're back, Minister. I was just asking. I, will, I, I want to turn off a microphone and turn it off the entire thing. Sorry, Chair. That's fine. Minister, just um, to confirm, are, are you here till quarter to 11? I'm quarter to 11 is uh, what, I'm, what I'm scheduled to, Chair, but if, if, if you need me to go earlier than that, I'm happy to okay. just support the committee in doing that. Okay, well, th well, thank you very much, Minister, for your opening remarks. Just um, for the sake of our members, um, we will be giving each um, um, of everybody about um, six or seven minutes then for questions, so use that as you as you wish. I, I'll start off with my first question. Minister, in relation to the vaccination programme, there's still some concerns regarding lack of regular testing and access to vaccination for those in hospices and residential homes. Obviously, you've, you've touched upon the care homes and that's to be welcomed, but could you maybe comment on hospices and residential homes, please? Um, and, and I think, Chair, what we will be using, we'll be using those same Robin vaccination teams that we used um, for the care home sector. So once we get them completed and the risk assessment done on the next phase of uh, those residential homes, um, uh, we are working through the, a grading system for those in regards to, you know, we have some full capacity uh, or, or settings. Uh, where those um, in age groups are able to attend their GPs for vaccination. But there are other settings who are in all but practice uh, care homes, although they may not be in name. So we are looking at how we get to those with the mobile vaccination teams that we're currently using in our care home sector. So that is all, all in the train of programme. I'm aware that Patricia is due to, to come in front of the committee next week, so we'll be able to provide the exact details or more, or more refined details on that. So it should be helpful for the committee. Okay, and I appreciate that um, Patricia Donnelly will be attending um, the meeting next um, week. However, um, there, there's a question around communication with the over 80s. I had a constituent whose mother was 88 and she missed the phone call. So then when the daughter phoned the GP practice and says, oh, you've missed this round. Um, obviously, th that's a very vulnerable age group. Not all of them are very mobile. Not all of them have got great hearing. And I'm not sure whether one phone call is sufficient. I think there's also an issue around communicating with carers and carers who are coming into the home who are in receipt of direct payments. Uh, again, it, it, it's quite an isolated group of people, Minister, and I'm just wondering how you're going to improve communication with the over 80s through the GP practices and also then with carers. Thank you. Um, Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed to, to hear that experience, Chair, but what we have done is that actually that all of the I all I think apart from one pack of the health and AstraZeneca and uh, vaccine that we received in the first batch um, has been distributed to all, all our GPs. So they have uh, 
the ability to do that is disappointing that they missed that call. We are expecting another two deliveries of AstraZeneca, uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which will go back out to the GP practices on that, that delivery process. That will be coming in to start next week. Um, so hopefully, look, if you can get the details of that, uh, that constituency to us, we'll make sure it gets passed on to the GP to make sure they get back into that system as well as possible. It hasn't been possible uh, in some practices um, to vaccinate all the 80s or overs in this original batch because of the number of vaccines that we received in the first delivery. But as the, the supply of vaccines comes online and it's more secured, um, and that delivery process is and gets out to GP practices, we'll be able to, to get through those cohorts and then some of the other cohorts uh, as quickly as, as possible. In regards to those in receipts of, of direct care payments, uh, we are looking to make sure that they are actually um, put in along with, with carers or even if we can't prioritise them uh, at a higher level as well while we look through the JCBI um, accreditation. Uh, it's a piece of work that's been looked at if we can even get them in along with the other uh, caring professions that have been brought forward, you know, the likes of our, our community pharmacies and dentists. We already have access to the system because they do meet uh, some of the similar criteria. So again, it, it's a piece of, piece of work that is ongoing, and as you say, you know, it is a small um, but very crucial uh, cohort because they are actually in receipt of direct payments. So technically, uh, we think and we hope we can classify them as healthcare workers. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, I, I'm still receiving some calls from um, people in relation to the track and trace, the contact tracing service that they're aware of close contacts who haven't, um, uh, who've been tested positive, but they haven't received the call. I think in the chamber there recently you said that over 80% of people are getting the call within 24 hours. Uh, are, are there still ongoing problems, Minister, and are any of these related to the, to the very high number of cases at the minute? Could you please give us an update on track and trace? Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Chair. And again, I just back to that point of, of ensuring that anybody who has a positive contact actually passes on um, the details of who they have been in, in, in contact with. Um, and I think the, the, the latest update um, that I have on that is for the week up until the, the 10th of January. Um, we did see a significant increase uh, of cases, as the, as the chairs know and the members know. Um, oh, for, for that week, for the seven days up until the 10th of January, uh, 10,232 cases uh, were transferred to the, the, the contact tracing system. Uh, of those, we made a successful contact with 9,591. So that's 93.7% successful contact of, of those first cases. So it is a very high, le high level of, of initial contact. Chair, I'm getting feedback. Yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not... It's dreadful. It's not great. Um, yeah. Will we suspend the meeting for a minute, or...? It, it seems to be at your end, Minister, apparently. Well, I'm, I'm in the room, so... Um, do, you, do you have access to head headphones, Minister? Um, I don't. Maybe it's the chief medical officer because when he came on, it started to become. Okay. Um, all right. Are all the other callers on the on the um, Starleaf? Are they on mute? Um. I'm just okay, going to suspend sorry, for a minute, okay. Minister. I, I think you're right. We, we're, we're getting it worse here. I'll just suspend the meeting. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, Minister, thank you. Um, we're, we're, I think we're back um, live, and thank you for finding headphones. I think that broadcasting it said that should should hopefully improve things. I just have one last um, question. Um, sorry, we just 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 to maybe finish out a bit on um, contact tracing. Oh yeah. Um, what I had uh, now we got until the tenth of January. We um, over ten thousand cases transferred. Um, nearly nine thousand six hundred of those were contacted, so ninety three point seven percent. Uh, what we saw now was a very low um, indication of contacts for those initial cases, which f had fell nearly by half from, from previous weeks. So although with ten, over 10,000 uh, positive cases, we were only indicated in the of over 14,000 um, close contacts who were identified by those people who had tested positive. And because of that, we were able to, to actually trace up to 99.6% of those, um, so with a very low loan dropout that we weren't able to, to contact as well, but just those numbers of um, positive cases to, to contacts we were identified uh, was at a very low low number, so 1 point, 1 point, around 1.5 for every positive case. Would be in keeping with people complying to the stay-at-home message, um, so it's an indication that, that maybe that had brought through, but still a high number of, of cases being transferred. Um, thank you, Minister. And I'm just going to pick up on that last comment you said there about staying at home. Um, it, it's very regrettable that the South Eastern Trust has um, not been able to um, continue its early medical abortion service, Minister. Um, obviously, um, the, these are not commissioned services, and the um, advice that women who are um, presenting is to travel to England. Um, Minister, there's a lot of very vulnerable, isolated um, young women out there who are looking for leadership and access to services in this. Minister, I don't want the response regarding um, that this is a contentious issue and it's up to the executive to decide on, but I would like you to, to explain to the women out there why you haven't brought forward abortion services and why you haven't introduced telemedicine here when you have done it for other um, um, branches of health here. Thank you. Um, Chair, it may not be the, the answer you, you, you want me to give, but it is uh, the answer that is, is realistic, um, because abortion in Northern Ireland is a contentious issue. It is uh, with the executive at this moment in time. Trusts are, are delivering a, a service. The South Eastern, as you say, had to withdraw that um, service over the past number of days when the Northern uh, was actually able to to reinstitute that service as well. So there is the ability still for, for anyone seeking that service to transfer uh, to another site, and that's been um, managed and facilitated as well by, by BPAS, I think it is, is the organisation that's doing it. Okay. okay, Minister, I think we'll, we'll keep coming back to this issue until it's resolved. I'm going to move on. I'm going to bring in our um, Deputy Chair, uh, and that's Pam Cameron. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank the uh, thank you, Minister, for your attendance um, at today's committee. I, I suppose just from the outset, I wanted to um, welcome the, the announcement on the perinatal mental health um, announcement um, and put on record my thanks to Lindsay Robinson for um, her tireless campaign on this really important issue. It's it's one that I have some experience with myself, um, uh, where I had a very traumatic birth of my first child back in. 1992, and I, there wasn't even awareness of the issue, let alone um, services to support uh, those perinatal mental health issues. So it's an incredibly important issue which desperately needs funding. So I do welcome um, your commitment to this issue, Minister. Um, Minister, there's also been um, a fear that uh, the very loud anti-vaccine voices would affect the rollout of the the COVID vaccine. And I'm very relieved to say that it's not something I'm now experiencing. It's very evident that there is a clamouring for more information on when the vaccine will be made available. And um, for uh, there's been obviously many calls as well for 
different areas of different key workers, such as um, PSNI and teachers, that, that they should get uh, uh, a higher priority on that vaccine list. I wonder, would you just like to take this opportunity to reinforce um, the why we're using the, the JCVI list? And also, can you address the concerns of BMA and explain why the decision has been taken to move the timeline on when the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine is given to frontline healthcare workers? That's my first one. Um, um, thanks, Pam. You know, and, and for you know, for your first point as well. You know, to be able to to bring forward the, the decision and the, the delivery of the perinatal uh, mental health community service, um, I, I think is something that has been a long time coming in Northern Ireland, um, and the work that has been done. Uh, between you know, Lindsay and the, the group that she has around her working with uh, the Health and Social Care Board, Public Health Agency and their own departmental officials here <laughs> and bringing forward that business case. Um, a, a very cold term used to describe a very essential service. But, you know, it was, it was something that, that we had committed to at the start um, you know, almost this time last year. And, and thanks to you know, Lindsay and her the way, not just even her campaign, but the way she campaigned, it was an informed, it was uh, an engaging, and it was an evidence-based, uh, practice-based, personal experience-based campaign, which really brought home, I think, the need for many of, of the delivery of this service. So, look, it, it will be it will be a big step, I think, for us when we do get up when it does get up and running, and we're able to get it um, get it going, you know, this year as well, because it will make the world a difference. Um, to, to many individuals. Um, in, in regards to, to the, anti, the anti-vaccination campaign, I think what we're actually seeing now in the address in your, in your next question, uh, it's not about those people who are reluctant, there's people wanting to get the vaccine now, so we're being, we are being uh, constrained by, by the receipt of the vaccines that we are getting. We're now, into, uh, we're now moving into a more regular delivery schedule, which should be started next week, which allows us um, to get back out to those other those other individual groups and expand that, that priority groups that we have. Um, unfortunately, now, and I did have a report last week that we were seeing some evidence of protesters uh, appearing outside our, our regional vaccination centres. Um, very, and, and actually with a very concerning uh, narrative that they were approaching um, those young women who are employed in our health service who were coming forward to receive vaccination. And actually targeting them specifically by how this vaccine would affect their their fertility in the future. So, quite a negative, um, quite a wrong uh, position to be put in, and quite a damaging position uh, to be put in as well. But uh, it was a very small number uh, at one specific site, so I don't want to give them any more oxygen than than, than they deserve or that they had. But we are seeing a good uptake. It's not something that we've seen uh, actually being deep rooted in Northern Ireland. Um, in regards to, to the priority of, of the JCVI uh, guidance in regards to those vaccine groups, it was clearly made in the regards of the receipt of vaccine and the ability to save lives. Um, some of, some of the, the, the accreditation, some of the guidance that was, was actually being given to us um, from JCVI was, you know, when you were in those high, high cohorts, those high priority groups, vaccinating one in 40 saved a life. Whereas you go further down the, 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 the different cohorts, you know, it's up to one in, one in 30,000 needed vaccine to save a life as well. So, so the criteria and the guidance of JCPI and their risk based uh, approach of who could receive it and when they should receive it was about saving lives. Uh, and that's the approach that we've taken to. It's the approach that um, all four health ministers um, across the United Kingdom have, have adopted and on will be. Will, will be sticking to. So, you know, it's not about this isn't an I've seen it being portrayed. This is a, a, a political decision. It's one that's science based, it's one that's evidence based as well, and this one that's supported. It's one that's been endorsed, you know, and I used this, I used this the, the last time I appeared in front of the committee. So, rather than it being a, you know, a political decision, you know, you've got a Scottish Nationalist Health Minister administering the same advice and guidance, you've got a Welsh Labour Minister. Uh, delivering the same advice and guidance with the unions in Northern Ireland, part of the five party executive, following the same advice and guidance as well. So it's not it's not political, it's science and evidence based. 
Um, the BME uh, have voiced uh, their concerns in regards to the availability um, of the second dose. I met, I met their chair, Tom Black, um, last last month, or maybe the month before, in regards to, to, to this specific issue to talk it through to him. And, and look, there is an understanding, I think, from their membership. There's also a push as well. They are creating more than they have their opinion representing their members as well. But our priority is, is to get as many people as possible to receiving their first vaccine um, because it does um, save lives. The, the, the Academy of Royal Colleges um, have come out and um, supported the approach. SAGE has supported the approach. Independent SAGE has a, uh, supported this approach as well. So the second vaccines will be there, but not just at the initial time claim uh, that the manufacturer had, had indicated. In regards for you know for the calls to move up other other groups or other professions, um, I, I suppose put them uh, in a different position on the JCBI uh, accreditation. Though I hear them, I, I hear the arguments being made, but from least to the guidance that this is about um, vaccinating those most vulnerable groups, those groups who are most um, susceptible to actually to loss of life, um, to go with. Uh, that's the priority we're taking. There is a bit more of that advice and guidance changes from JCBI to the four health um, ministers and, and the four CMOs as well. I um, mean, that's when we will, we will look at that as well. But you know, it's, it's a hard decision because if you do prioritise a group, you have to deprioritise someone as well. Because to move somebody up, you have to move somebody down. Uh, and that's the, that's the challenge. That's, that, that will come up with any of those decisions that have to be made. Um, so, okay. Thank you. Um, Pam, I, I'm going to move on. I'm trying to allocate about eight minutes to each of the members, so we'll, we'll maybe come back to you if you have any um, follow-ups or any further questions. So the next person I have is Jonathan, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Minister and Chief Medical Officer. Uh, I suppose we've watched all with interest, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the number of cases across the British Isles, and most notably, actually, as well, that within the Republic of Ireland at the moment. Uh, just a few days ago, some politicians, including members of this committee, were calling for a travel ban from Great Britain due to the emergence of a new variant uh, of coronavirus. Uh, so, can I ask the Chief Medical Officer to provide his assessment uh, of the nature of the threat at the time, vis-à-vis -vis the, the current threat? Of transmission in the Republic of Ireland, uh, how which now have, have some of the highest rates, unfortunately, in the world. Uh, can the minute or can the chief medical officer perhaps give us an update on that? Uh, and uh, the question as to whether we should be potentially considering stronger cross cross border enforcement. Uh, well, uh, thank you, John, for your for your question. Uh, I, I think it's important that we all bear in mind that vaccine. Um, Sorry, this virus has behaved very different at very different stages of the uh, pandemic across uh, the four UK nations and indeed across the Republic of Ireland. In the first wave, as we know, they, it behaved broadly similar uh, in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, in the second wave, uh, we had a higher uh, prevalence of infection here than uh, the Republic of Ireland. And now in this wave, uh, the Republic of Ireland is suffering uh, significant pressures in terms of uh, prevalence uh, and also pressures on its health service. Um, if we compare and contrast ourselves to the rest of the United Kingdom, we have a comparable rate um, to England. Uh, now, obviously, that's looking at England as a whole, uh, and a slightly higher prevalence uh, as compared to, to uh, Wales, and then higher again as compared to Scotland. I think that just reflects the, the variation in terms of how the virus has behaved, and indeed, uh, the different uh, times of the introduction of various restrictions and also the population um, adherence uh, to those restrictions. Um, there is no doubt that uh, we are very mindful of the fact that the new variant is in circulation. Um, we have taken steps, the Minister uh, and they agreed to steps to advise against anyone who is travelling from the United Kingdom uh, into Northern Ireland or from the Republic of Ireland who self-isolate for a period of, of 10 days if they are staying overnight, recognising, however, that there is free flow of mo uh, movement of people and goods across the border on a regular basis. Obviously, uh, we need to respect that. Many of those individuals are healthcare workers, and what we don't want to do is actually place added pressures on our healthcare system, particularly uh, at this time. 
there is no doubt that we will continue to see new variants arise. Um, putting in place uh, travel bans uh, or restricting travel will only have a limited impact for a very short time on the emergence of those new variants. Uh, we know that the particular uh, new variant, which is um, known as the UK variant, although uh, it was detected there first, we don't know whether that's necessarily where it arose first, um, is certainly widespread in, in uh, parts of in London, the southeast, southwest, uh, and increasing in other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, it certainly is present, as we know, in uh, Northern Ireland before Christmas, um, and I'm, I have no doubt is present in increasing the amounts here. It has established, sadly, a, a foothold in the Republic of Ireland, um, and I have no doubt that that's what's adding to their significant pressures uh, at this time. <clears throat> Obviously, any decisions uh, around um, restrictions on movement or on uh, travel are matters for, for ministers, ultimately. Um, my own view, uh, certainly based from a sort of scientific and, and public health uh, position, would be that, as we've indicated before to the committee, that I think uh, Ian mentioned when he was last in front of you, that um, that would likely have uh, a, you know, a very small additional impact over and above the measures uh, that we currently have in place. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you, okay. Chief Medical Officer. Um, and just because I, I want to move on because I, I have a limited period of time, could I ask the Minister? Uh, the Minister will agree with me, I'm sure, the very positive role that the military have played throughout the UK and during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, can I ask why the Minister hasn't activated the military aid for civil authorities process for MOD support in Northern Ireland, given that that is being used across the United Kingdom at present? Um, um, thanks, Johnny. We actually have instigated a number of MAGAs. Um, we, we've used them in the past and we've, we've used them uh, initially uh, when we've had to transfer patients from North America across to the northeast of England for ECMO treatments um, as well. We also, uh, you only have to, uh, I suppose, activate the MAGA when it's at an increased level of, of interaction and sustainability uh, from military intervention. And, you know, it's something we keep right, readily available. We have actually an officer um, from the MLD assigned to the department in half has since the start of this, this pandemic. So we engage with them regularly. Okay. Um, as well, and we also use them for, for logistical uh, supports as well uh, in regards to the initial setting up I mean, for PPE distributions. Uh, we used them towards the end of, of last year in regards to um, how we were actually in preparation for our this third, third surge that we're putting into as to how we could utilize that and logistical support or, or better and, and form more logistics uh, in regards to ICU okay. capacity and also respiratory capacity across the entirety um, of our systems as well because we were working into this. Okay, well, Minister, we, uh, sorry. The managing of oxygen supplies as well, so it's, yeah. it's a facility we use and uh, it's access we have quite regularly. Okay, well, Minister, given the significant pressures that are facing the health service at present, uh, pictures and footage of uh, ambulances waiting, uh, etc., and calls for Cross the Trust for staff. Uh, w will you be making a call for the use of, of the MOD through that uh, military aid for civil authorities process now? Uh, we, we've heard that there is something like, I think it's 10 dedicated PSNI officers assisting with, uh, say, for example, ambulance service driving at the moment, a, a, a job in which the military could do very well. Uh, and also, indeed, with the logistical issues in relation to vaccine rollout, we know that the military have the logistical expertise to deliver programmes like this, and also those support services. And given the pressures that we're facing right across the trusts at the moment, uh, I, I would encourage you, please, to bring forward that call. We did here in the House of Commons. I think it was yesterday, uh, Minister Ben Wallace saying that if the call comes, the support will be provided. And John, it's, it's always uh, matching, you know, the call for, for what we can utilise as well. You know, and as I said, we, we, we do the regular assessments. We have those regular meetings um, with the MOD uh, in regards to how their availability of, of resource actually meets our demand and make sure there's a match. Uh, and I think you, you touched on one actually that, that I had, had asked to be explored in one, uh, was in regards to the support of our ambulance services. Um, we are currently using, uh, or we will be introducing, and using PSNI and um, fire brigade officers uh, to drive some of our ambulances. We couldn't actually deploy um, military personnel because they're not blue light 
uh, had certified drivers in Northern Ireland. Uh, so if we'd actually used a military resource to drive an ambulance, they would still have they've supported it by another blue light vehicle, so we'd have to bring an additional AFNI support to, to, to utilize that that facility, but actually would have put on additional resources. So that's why we're we're utilizing um, that's why we're utilizing uh, fire brigade and police to provide that additional support to our ambulance in the way of, of drivers. And in regards to the logistic logistical deployment of or our vaccination program, we've seen, you know, Patricia has got that updated well. One of the things that we did, as I said earlier on, uh, when it came to, to the BSO deployment of our PPE during the first wave, uh, we sought military advice and guidance specifically in the logistic approach uh, of how that could be done, how it could be improved, how it could be streamlined, and we were able to do it within our, our own resource within BSO as well. Um, and I think one, one of the most right, one, one of the most recent updates that I got was actually of the the, of the, the military medical reservists in Northern Ireland. Um, I had previously, I think previously told my day was around 75% of them um, actually already employed in our health service. I think that there was a further piece of work done that was actually 96% uh, of military reservists, uh, medical military reservists in Northern Ireland were already deployed and already employed uh, across our health service as well. So it's not a resource that we can do readily. Uh, but you know we are engaged in conversations continually in regards to what additional resources is there. You know, they got any other health minister I only wish there was a, a battalion of ICU nurses sitting somewhere ready for us to call on because I can assure the member if there was I'd have called on them and I'd be using them. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Minister. I'm going to go across on the phone. Uh, I have in front of me Orlea, Pat, Cara, and possibly Jerry and Alan if they want to come in. So Orlea, please. Um, yes, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I just want to make two comments, and then if I can get two questions in, um, I'll see how I go. Um, first of all, just I want to um, reiterate the comments that, that Pa made around the announcement yesterday around the perinatal um, mental health services. Um, I want to thank the Minister, first and foremost. It's, I mean, that's a, it's a big, big deal, for, as you know, for, for the sector and the campaigners. And Pam already referenced people like Lindsay Robinson. That have just done a fantastic um, campaign and getting this over the line, but we really, really appreciate it. I certainly do anyway. Um, and I'm sure we'll all be knocking on your door very soon to keep the momentum building for the mother and baby units. So thanks very much for that. But um, maybe just to bring it back into the point that, that Paula had made in, in her comments as well. Um, you know, I do think it's unfortunate on the one hand, you know, we're celebrating um, that protection of women's mental health on the one hand. And then when we're coming on to the issue of women um, being able to access um, safe abortion services, um, we're still at a loss and that's impacting on women's mental health also. And I think the health committee needs to be um, cognizant of that. So um, I appreciate, Minister, that the, you did mention that it is, of course, still a contentious issue for some members. And, and I understand that. But um, sure, I would certainly like the health committee to, to come back to this um, because it is a health care issue. And I think we all need to um, bear that in mind. Um, so just moving on there, maybe to some quick questions. And thanks to um, the CMO and the Minister for the updates that you have given thus far. Uh, Minister, you had mentioned in your presentation, obviously, with the vaccine, and I know this has been publicised and spoke about in the media as well. Um, so we're working off the, this sort of phase programme that we'll have in place. And I, I know you are hoping that the vaccine um, should be here. Um, for what is required to keep rolling it out at the end of January and into February. I'm just wondering, and maybe you can't, but can you just give yourself and the CMO, can you give any guarantees um, to the public and to the health committee at the moment um, <coughs> if you think your this vaccination programme can stay on track? Um, uh, thanks, really, and uh, I suppose uh, just in, in regards to, to your comment as well, in regards to the mother and baby unit, um, one of the things that we did with the business case was actually split the two of them, so we could deliver deliver the community service, um, and and then not you know and then look at the mother and baby unit actually as another project as well. So, you know, what I will say to you very clearly is you know I appreciate you coming and continuing knocking on my door for it, um, but I would appreciate it if you knocked on Connor's door as well. So you know the, the financing of all, all, all these all, all these projects has come, come, comes as well. 
Uh, in regards of, of the vaccination process, um, are we content that we will have supply? We actually attended, there was a meeting last night um, that I attended along with the First and Deputy First Minister, First Minister of Scotland, uh, First Minister of Wales, which was chaired by the, the Chancellor of the Dutch Airline, Captain Michael Gove, in regards to what's specifically on vaccination supply and how they how they are managing, how they're looking at it from a uh, three month forward look, uh, and then bringing it back down to a four week. Uh, what is expected to a week, a two week delivery? This is actually what's in front of us. So, if we can maintain uh, what that three month forward look is in that delivery schedule, uh, we will be able to meet the, the ambitious time frame um, that, that we have actually set ourselves here uh, in Northern Ireland. I think it, it was actually very well uh, explained. We had, a, 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 I suppose, a presentation there, for want of a better word, about the the, the process of, of manufacturing of a vaccine, where it is a three-month process, you know, there's a month, month basically, and then, you know, it was explained quite simply so that I, you know, so that we, well, I was going to say I could understand it, but the, so that the lay people in the meeting could understand it. You know, the, the first month is really about bringing all the ingredients together, mixing them together. The next month is about um, that process, the batching, and the certification, the quality checks as well. And then the third and last month of that process is about making sure that each batch can out has received uh, the appropriate quality uh, scrutiny by MRHA before that batch is, is released um, to to us to actually utilise. So that's why it's really about a three month a three month forward look. If anything, if any step in that process goes wrong, I'm going to lose a batch uh, from one of the manufacturers. It will have have a knock on effect. But what we're looking at at this moment in time, our, our programme is achievable. And I think one of the, th the things to highlight, and, and I think why we're seeing uh, the success rate in our, in our GPs, um, getting some feedback and some data specifically from the GP programme, um, we have only, um, and I use the word lost, or I don't like we wasted isn't the right word out, out of that entire programme since we've started, we've only lost 98 vaccines, which is a 0.6 uh, percent of what we've been able to deliver. It. Um, the acceptable target for a vaccine program like this is 10 percent. So we're really achieving one that's through the quality processes uh, and the logistical supplies that have been put in place that is allowing us to get the maximum effect of the deliveries that we are receiving. Okay, Minister, thanks very much um, for, for those answers there. And just my final question is around. Um, so um, obviously it's been spoke about a few times um, a committee also around the motion that were brought into the assembly it was back in november um, which had cross-party support and it was around obviously trying to contain a new um, more robust COVID strategy um, i know that the department um, i think the last strategy that's been published online was in may 2020 around the fine test trace and protect um, so I'm just wondering, is there any update from we we passed that motion on the floor um, of the assembly chamber um, for the call on the department to um, to contain a new robust strategy? Has anything been put on paper, worked on? Is there anything that the committee um, can get can get side of? And I'm not sure if obviously Jonathan had touched on um, the the transmission on an island wide basis as well, um, and. Hopefully, that's that's factoring in. That's an important factor in, in the the new strategy um, from the Department of Health. But just on that point, a quick question: right, When was your last engagement with Stephen Donnelly um, in the South? Because obviously, it's a serious issue in way for us. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think of that. We, last, we last spoke at the North South Ministerial Council meeting, which was just before Christmas. Now we have been in correspondence on a number of issues um, over the past few days. Uh, actually, as in regards to. Still a concern that I have about the, the information we're getting uh, in regards to travel locator forms, um, because I think as you know, CMO uh, spoke about earlier, we're seeing new variants uh, spring up around the world. You know, I think there's one been recently identified in Brazil. What concerns me is if we're not getting that information uh, in a timely and robust form coming of those people who are arriving uh, on this island and then coming to Northern Ireland. You know, it does leave an open back door for us that I, that I have a concern about. In regards to, to strategy, I think there, there is more up to date if you look for even our surge plans in regards to how uh, the health service is actually going to maintain. Uh, there should be one there from October, if not even 
more recent date than that, that's specifically how, how we as a health department uh, respond to COVID. There's other number of vaccination programs as well. Um, you know, there's all those different all those different parts of what, what is a very rapidly changing uh, program on the greater strategy and how we react. Um, I think there's a piece of work that the executive has taken forward. It's a piece of work that has been brought under the umbrella. Um, I, I think was, was the phrase used by the Deputy First Minister um, yesterday at the Executive Office uh, about how this isn't just a, a Department of Health response to COVID, it has to be how all the departments uh, across the Executive come together and that's a piece of work that has been brought forward and been compiled by the, the COVID Task Force or the Executive COVID Task Force in the guards because it was seen, you know, this is about health um, working with communities, working with the economy, working with you know, everybody has a role to play about how we get to a better place, you know, in, in the next in the next couple of months, never mind what it looks like, what we actually do on the sixth of February, uh, when this current phase of restrictions should technically come to an end. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um thank you. Um Pat, a few questions there, please. Yes, thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks, Robin and Michael, for coming in today again to the committee. Um, we're, I suppose, almost a year into this pandemic uh, here, uh, and it's probably worth at some stage doing a review of, of how we have done. And uh, while I don't want to dwell on the past uh, too much, uh, we need to learn from the mistakes that have been made. And in my view, many people have died here needlessly. Uh, people who need not have died. Uh, other countries have performed much, much better than us. And one of the characteristics they have in common is that they have a coordinated, integrated and coherent strategy uh, to deal with this virus, uh, which is, is made up of a, a, a number of measures to tackle the virus, and including travel restrictions. And, and I have to say, and we've heard it here again this morning, that despite the fact that Hancock told us the virus was out of control in the south of England and that there was a new, a new variant becoming dominant, there were still no travel restrictions here. And, and, and we're being told that that uh, wasn't a significant risk to public health here in the north. I mean, people would be forgiven for thinking that's coming straight out of the Donald Trump uh, school of, of science. But in, in any event, my, my concern my concern here is that we don't have a clear objective in mind. And if we don't have a clear objective, it's then impossible to build a proper strategy. Uh, and, and, and others have had strategies. And even last week, uh, Gabriel Scali and Deirdre Heenan released a 10 point plan on how we should deal with this uh, virus. Now, my concern going forward is that the department is going to put all its eggs in the vaccination basket. And if that happens, there may be difficulties. First of all, we don't know how long protection is going to last for from the vaccines. Uh, secondly, we've no control over supply lines. And thirdly, and probably most worrying, is that uh, given the high levels of transmission throughout the world, the potential exists for uh, further mutations that may be resistant to vaccines. So uh, I, I wonder, Minister, if you could outline what the strategy is going to be uh, as we move forward. Uh, we don't want to be here this time next year and in a similar situation. Thanks. Um, and thanks, Pat. And again, I, I, I do want to take exception about some of your language and the Trumpian approach to, to science because it's, it's not something we've done. Um, I know it's a phrase you used yesterday in the TEO committee as well. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's accurate. I don't think it's a review of how we in North America have reacted to this. I don't think it's accurate in response as to how actually our executive, uh, the five party executive has reviewed or, or reacted um, to this as well. So look, and I know uh, I, there, there's talk of, of the this, this strategy and our approach and I think already I mentioned it in the strategy. Um, that is available is the one that was established by the executive, um, one that was agreed by the executive back in May, and that was about setting the target of keeping R below one, and that we could just fill it below one, and that is at every step, at every interaction that we take, at every reduction of restrictions um, that we have come forward to the Department of Health to suggest to the executive 
has always been about achieving that and how we do that. Um, and that is where we are. And it's also a little bit that basis of it protecting and sustaining the, the NHS. And that's why we've always seen the executive uh, willing to take and follow that strategy that was laid out in May and taking those harder decisions when we see the NHS and our health service becoming uh, under the pressure that it's currently under. So that's when, when that strategy kicks in. And I think that was said to, to, to a response to, to earlier as well, the necessity um, of that piece of work and across the executive in regards to how we support everyone, uh, how we support our businesses, how we support those most in need, and how you think it's something that you yourself was raised about how we actually uh, address the inequalities of our folks, the health inequalities, the economic inequalities that we are seeing actually being exacerbated um, through through the COVID. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, we as a department are not putting all our eggs in the, in the vaccine basket. Um, I would say actually quite the, the reverse. Uh, we are seeing vaccine as part of the answer. It's not the entirety of the answer. And that's why we've been continually um, asking people to, to adhere to the guidance that's already there to follow the restrictions um, that we have in place. Because the vaccine, as you rightly say, you know, it's not going to be the sole answer straight away. It will take time for the benefits of it to bed in. And while that is doing it, we still have to follow those restrictions that are in place. We may have to actually introduce more um, as well to make sure that we keep uh, and follow that strategy and that target that was laid out by the executive back in May of keeping our um, below one. Um, in regards to, to travel, and you have mentioned, you have mentioned that I think one of the things that we did do um, back in, in, in December at that point in time was introduce that 10 day isolation requirement. Uh, from anybody coming from GB or the Republic of Ireland, that, you know, as Johnny indicated earlier on, uh, there is a concern and there still is a concern of the increasing numbers uh, and the increasing rate actually in the Republic of Ireland at this moment in time. So that's why the executive uh, agreed to put in that 10-day isolation requirement for any moment around Northern Ireland at that point in time. Uh, th thanks for thanks for that, Robin. But I mean, if if you use any yardstick, even if, as you say, the objective is to keep the R number below one, I mean, we have failed in that. Uh, I, I mean, the the health service is under more pressure now than it has has ever been, and 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 you know, uh, I mean, I I would love to be sitting here and congratulating you on the great job that you have done, uh, but. I mean, many, many mistakes have been made uh, and some of the advice has been very questionable. Uh, but I, I think you, you need to start taking advice from, from, from outside the department, from people who are experts in, in the field of public health, and particularly those who have expertise uh, in, in the areas, in the countries uh, where they have successfully uh, combated this virus and allowed society to open up uh, almost as, as normal. Uh, and, and, and I think it's important that you outline what the strategy of the department is in the time ahead. Uh, I'm going to leave it there on that. I just want to ask you a, a question about uh, neurology and, and when you expect to have uh, information on cohort two and when that will be released and uh, any update on the public inquiry uh, and, and, and when it expects uh, to really get into the, into the, the nitty-gritty of the work it has to do. Thanks. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Thanks, Pat, on, on, your, on your, your, your last question. But I want to come back to, to some of the other ones. Well, you know, hindsight in regards to how we manage and how we've done this, you know, it's not a science or not, not a gift that we had uh, or we do have. So we have made changes to our approaches um, over the last over the last number of months as well, um, you talk about following advice within the department. Um, I, I'm confident the advice that I get is the best advice. Um, what I would only ask and could only wish for that others would have followed it as well from a leadership level down. Uh, if they've been able to set that example um, throughout the entirety of this pandemic, we may have been um, in, a, in a very different place. Um, there are those who, who seem to be willing to to give me um, advice on uh, guidance from outside to almost seem to be doing it now, uh, rather on a personal basis. 
on a political basis um, because I am aware of those who started out um, as experts in giving their clinical advice and, and public health advice on this on this pandemic have now moved that into a political and personal sphere as to where it comes down to personal attacks on me uh, and some of those within my department. Uh, but that's that's in their gift. Uh, and if that's what they have the time to do, then so be it. Uh, but I suppose in, in regards to, to the other the other questions that they asked in regards to, to neurology, we are hopeful to, to to make that announcement of cohort two very shortly once we have that piece of work um, actually completed. Uh, we have moved, uh, as you're aware, we've moved that inquiry into a full public inquiry um, under legislation. So Brad Lockhart and his team are, are now working with the full access all on the bars um, of the public inquiry that allows them the access uh, that they need to do under that. So that work is ongoing. And because of that additional additional powers that they haven't given the additional strength that they haven't given, that has made a lot of steps. So, we're awaiting feedback off from them as to what uh, actually implications and what additional supports uh, or structures that they need uh, now that that change has been made. But that should be, uh, in regards to cohort to that, that information should be on the call pretty soon. I'll get it to the committee um, as soon as we have it available and to yourself, Pat, because I know it's a piece of work um, that you've taken personal interest in and, and supported the, the people who have needed as well. Okay, thanks for that, Ron. Thank, thank you, Pat. Uh, Minister, just for calling the next member, um, way back at the start of the um, neurology recall, um, there was talk about a redress scheme for um, the patients who had been affected. And I remember the phrase at the time was that the department didn't want them to have to lawyer up and that something would be forthcoming quite quickly. Is that now going to be put on hold pending this public inquiry? Thank you. Um, it shouldn't be, Chair. Um... But in all honesty, I, I don't have the direct answer. I will come back to you um, on that because it was our intention, and it still is our intention. I think your and your phraseology is right. Um, you know, we don't want the app to look at um, you know um, individuals having the lawyer up. We wanted to see uh, an equitable and accessible uh, redress scheme actually established by the department. Uh, I'll check uh, if there is any implication uh, from moving to a public inquiry. There shouldn't be as far as I'm concerned, but I, I, I want to, to verify that point. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry, thank you, Minister. Appreciate that. Okay, Cara, would you like to come? Thank you, uh, Chair, and I'd like to thank the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer uh, for being here today before the committee. I always find it uh, their briefings very helpful. Uh, just a quick statement that I too would like to welcome uh, the Perinatal Mental Health Services uh, and the uh, statement that went out recently, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his efforts. Uh, around this issue and the activists and champions who have continued to campaign and other members uh, who have really pushed for this. So so thank you all uh, for campaigning for these crucial services. Um, uh, Minister, uh, I'd just like to touch uh, on, I'm seeking some clarity, this is an ethics uh, and an issue around consent with the delay of the vaccine. Um, this week I've spoken at length with both uh, the BMA and the Royal College of Nursing um, just around um, the delay of the second vaccine. Uh, so my question pertains to um, nurses and doctors and GPs. When they initially consented to receive the vaccine, uh, this, this, my statement refers to females, they were informed that they would see, receive the second vaccine 21 days later. Um, and it's my understanding female health workers had consented initially at the time to not get pregnant within three months of receiving the first vaccine. But now we're hearing about a delay of 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, I'm just curious around, unknown to them at the time, does this mean by proxy they have essentially consented to not get pregnant for up to the next six months? Cara, I'll let Michael come in on that specific point because I think there has been additional work in regards to, to pregnancy in regards to to the vaccine majorities. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Cara, for your question. And um, again, just to add my, I suppose, uh, recognition of the significant work that's going on in terms of establishing the per community perinatal mental health service and the need a more comprehensive service for, for women in Northern Ireland. And, and again, it, it is it is very much welcomed and, and uh, I'm no doubt that will be uh, appreciated by all. In terms of the, um, Individuals consent to a vaccine as opposed to a time frame from the vaccine. As you know, the original uh, advice, because these were new vaccines and there wasn't full data in relation to the Pfizer vaccine or indeed any other vaccine, was that 
uh, we should take a precautionary approach until such times as we have data on the safety of, of the vaccine in, in pregnancy and uh, also in relation uh, to breastfeeding. That clarification has subsequently been received, communicated to the service, and as women would have made that judgment in uh, conversation uh, with uh, occupational health or indeed with those advising them on the vaccine, it's about weighing up the risk and weighing up the benefit of the vaccine. So in those who have uh, uh, already come forward for their first dose, they will have their second dose uh, within the 12 week uh, time frame and there should be no uh, impediment uh, to decisions that they've made in relation to, to conception. Um, I would say that you know we need to bear in mind, as the Minister said earlier, this is actually about saving lives. Uh, this is about preventing severe disease and preventing hospitalisation. Um, and it's really crucially important, as the MHRA has advised and JCB has recommended, that we prioritise the first dose for as many people as possible, and that includes other healthcare workers, that includes the domiciliary care workers, the community pharmacists, um, dentists, and others who are at increased risk of exposure, who are currently now receiving their vaccine uh, as a consequence of the prioritisation of first dose, who otherwise would have had to wait for quite some considerable time. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, I just thought it was important to raise, just given that over 90% of nurses um, are female. So uh, thank you for your answer there, uh, Chief Medical Officer. Uh, my next question um, surrounds, um, uh, I'm being lobbied by students to, to kind of ask this, just around students and getting the vaccine rolled out. Well, have you had any conversations or liaised with universities um, on getting out to students or will it be more of a traditional role of uh, students going to their local GP to receive the vaccine? Um, again, Cara, and, and student access it will be through the JCBI uh, prioritization, so by age and by uh, clinical factors. So if a student does fall within a, one of the clinically extremely vulnerable groups or the extremely vulnerable groups that are in phase six um, or sorry, phase four of our program, they will be called forward by their GP. So we're not at the point yet then. It will be quite a while um, into this year before we're looking at those foot mass uh, vaccination centres for the younger cohort, you know, the, the age range of students you know, from the 18 to the early 20 year olds. So they will be brought forward through the normal route, through the normal call, the same as any other sector uh, of the population in Northern Ireland. The only thing to add to that, Minister, would be in relation, if you please, sorry, would be in relation to those healthcare students who are on placement. Uh, in wards uh, who are providing health care as part of their training. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, in those circumstances, they would be treated as other health care workers and uh, would receive their, their vaccine in those circumstances. Okay, thank you. Uh, just another question there, um, to get an understanding and a rough estimate, uh, what percentage of the population is currently being vaccinated every day and every week so far? Um, I, I don't have that sort, sort of bigger to, to date, but I do know where in the, in the moment, yeah. We are in the region, there's a close of play on, on the 12th of January, we vaccinated 4.8% um, of the entirety of the population of Northern Ireland. Um, at that point, um, uh, I, I think we were sitting on the league table about fourth or, or fifth um, in the world uh, in regards to vaccines deployed as percentage of uh, percentage of our population. Okay, Th thank you, Minister. And just my last question. Um, we're seeing in other countries, such as Germany, uh, they're adopting a an approach whereby they're including um, police teachers, day workers and retail workers as priority groups. Uh, it's my understanding that the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation allows for an element of flexibility um, at a local level. I'm just wondering, um, there, it's quite complex. W what we've seen is uh, under the current criteria, a 49-year-old special needs teacher in a school um, will be behind a 50-year-old lawyer who will be able to work from home during the duration of a pandemic, um, basically given off the vaccination program I have in front of me. Have you given any consideration um, for these groups, like special needs uh, teachers, to be moved up to receive the vaccine sooner? Um, Katakara, I would uh, caution against about pulling out specific examples that, like that, but I actually tried to set uh, one individual against another because some of those comparators um, 
aren't aren't aren't, 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 aren't exact. Uh, but in regards to the chaining, I think it was a response uh, to to the vice chair, as, as I said earlier on, to start to move uh, one group um, up uh, through the priority. You have to start moving someone down. Um, so by the time we get through, you know, to, to the rest of the vaccinating, vaccinating the, the public as well, it has been done by that criteria uh, set by the JCBI in regards to the ability to save lives. Um, rather than when we actually get to certain certain professions and certain cohorts. Michael, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, okay, thank you. Just to, just to mention that, yeah, I mean, I think uh, kind of just to come back to the priority that the Minister has said, I mean, we will be following the uh, scientific and expert advice of JCBI or independent from government. Um, and the first nine priority groups, if we get all of those vaccinated within the time frames that we are setting ourselves subject to supply of vaccine, we will prevent 99% of all deaths. And I think that's the important point here, um, that this is actually about preventing death, severe disease and hospitalisation. The JCBI, JCBI will be subsequently looking at the next phase of the vaccine programme, which is about those occupational groups that may have particularly increased risk and will be providing further advice uh, to government on that. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm going to go across to Jerry on the phone. Jerry, are you there? Oh, I think you're on mute, Jerry. Can you hear me, Trevor? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Great. Now, thanks. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, thanks, Fletcher. Uh, thanks, Minister. Um, a couple of questions, Minister. Um, my understanding, firstly, is cohort two. Uh, for the neurology inquiry has been ready since October, so um, if you can confirm that, that would be uh, helpful. Uh, in regards to the, the vaccination uh, programme, I mean, obviously, Pam talked upon it, the BMA reps being in touch, uh, expressing their uh, loss of confidence in the way the, mm -hmm. the Pfizer scheme has been handled. Um, and I suppose really I would like a, a comment uh, to expand maybe on the science rather than just a political decision, if you, if you can. Um, they're concerned specifically um, as well about anti-gen uh, blindness and my understanding is the concern is people who uh, have, who got the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine expecting the second dose to come within the, the three-week period but are, who may get the second dose of, of the AstraZeneca um, vaccine which can potentially provide uh, issues so if you could clarify uh, that then also hearing um, and seeing concerns about people who are coming forward to volunteer and there's either um, obstacles put in their way or people who um, don't have a medical uh, background but have uh, skills in, in admin mm -hmm. but aren't really being followed up upon. So um, I think that those issues uh, need to be uh, addressed. I, I just thank you for this round. Um, I, I think Pat's right that the people need to see die, but I think it's it's been the response of the, the executive whole strategy, uh, which is basically a pursuit to live with COVID, which has been a very, very dangerous uh, and deadly strategy. And I seen the minister, I think it was yesterday in the Telegraph, expressing maybe some regret or concern about the Christmas period and, and how things were, were handled. Um, how confident is he with the R rate thankfully fallen? But yeah, we obviously have 800 plus people uh, in hospital with, with COVID. How confident is he that uh, the executive parties have all learned uh, not to follow the, the dangerous path that was followed uh, previously? Thank you. Um, uh, thank, well, thanks, uh, Jerry. And uh, there's, there's, there's a number of things there. Uh, just in, in regards to the, the, the specific and, and scientific uh, advice through the movement in three weeks from, from Pfizer, let the chief medical officer build up on that because uh, it's not it's not political, it is, it is science based and it's, it's about the decision about getting that first vaccination to as many people as possible. There is no intention uh, of that mix and match approach uh, and I want the, to, to, to put that on record here that you know, it's not about somebody getting a first dose of Pfizer and then a, first, and then a second dose of Oxford. It's because of the systems that we have set up where the GPs are delivering our Oxford on the AstraZeneca program. Uh, our regional vaccination systems are, are using the Pfizer vaccines as well. So it's different cohorts being called to different locations. 
Uh, so the only way that somebody could actually get that mix and match is by approaching the two systems uh, out of step deliberately. Uh, and to do that, they, they would actually be uh, preventing someone uh, from getting their first dose uh, through that different that different engagement as well. In regards to, to the, the volunteers and the workforce appeal, as I said, and, and the delivery systems that we have, at this moment in time, especially at the regional approach and the regional centres, um, we have a workforce appeal out so that when we get to uh, the greater sustained supply of more vaccine, where we will still be delivering people's first doses alongside uh, the cohorts who are receiving their second dose, we know we will we'll need to significantly ramp up workforce as well. So that's why the preparation work's been done um, at this moment in time. I've, I've seen um, some, some of the commentary around you know, the additional uh, hoops that people feel they're going through. Uh, what I will say, you know, anybody delivering a vaccine uh, at that stage, this is still uh, a medical procedure. So it is about making sure that anybody who is doing that is still of the appropriate accreditation skills and access criteria uh, to be able to do that. So the workforce appeal is working through those um, at this moment in time. And I'm, I'm aware that they've written out to, to anyone who had applied um, through the, the administration side of that program recently because they are prioritizing those who may be able to come forward um, as vaccinators uh, as the initial the initial cohort as well. Uh, and in regards to in regards to the neurology and cohort two, as I said, the you know, we're working our way through that and we'll get that announcement out to people as soon as we pack the new plan because it is an important piece of work for me and for my department as well and that's why uh, I moved that uh, status to uh, the, the public inquiry and um, Give, give it that, that power of, of, of force as well. Michael, do you want to come in basically on the on the scientific uh, support for moving away from the three weeks? Certainly, Minister. Thank you, and thank you, Jerry, uh, for the question. Um, as the Minister said, um, obviously, the advice to ministers is based on the on the science uh, and uh, both the evidence of the effectiveness of the vaccine and the public health advice. The MHRA uh, authorization uh, approved uh, the strategy of uh, prioritizing first dose. It's entirely in keeping with the European Medicines Agency conditional uh, authorization of the vaccine, and it's consistent with the uh, JCVI recommendation. Both of those uh, bodies, the MHRA and indeed the JCVI, are independent uh, from, from government. Uh, you know, are comprised of uh, the best scientists and, and health experts looking at this data, all of which is in the public domain, uh, independently looking at the data from the phase one, phase two, and indeed the phase three trials. And what that evidence shows is that between two and three weeks after the uh, first dose of both vaccines, that the uh, protection afforded from clinical disease, and that's what we're talking about, is between uh, is high. Uh, between 70 and 90 percent. What we do know is that the second uh, dose is uh, of benefit for, for longer term protection and immunity. But as JCVI has also said in its statement, what we also know from other vaccines is that uh, it is often the case that spacing the time interval between the first dose and the second dose results in a more effective immune uh, response. And there is no reason to suspect that that may not uh, be the case uh, with this vaccine. I have to say there have been concerns voiced, and I've heard them in the public domain, about uh, increased risk of transmission, if indeed there's a delay in the second dose, uh, or uh, or other aspects of that. We have no evidence, as I said yesterday in the media briefing, we have no evidence at this point in time which would suggest that being vaccinated reduces the risk of people carrying the virus asymptomatically or passing the virus on to others. So, so to suggest that delaying the second dose puts people uh, at, at risk of passing on the virus. We have no evidence uh, one way or the other uh, okay. at this yeah, point in time. Yeah. But I do understand the frustration of staff and the concerns of staff, uh, and I think that is recognised. Th thanks, Michael. Quickly, sir, if I can. Um, Minister, you, you mentioned about the, the cancellation of the of urgent cancer and other um, treatments and services. I mean, obviously, on the face of it, it, it is about the rise of COVID, but to me, it points to you know further issues of overinvestment in our health service, lack of investment in staff, uh, treating staff, um, 
uh, we could all pay for too long. Um, how many people are, are affected and imp- impacted by this decision? Uh, and what plans are in place to permanently uplift the number of uh, staff that we have and what work is being done to uh, basically to acquire and take into public uh, control the private uh, hospital uh, facilities and beds that do exist. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jerry. And, and uh, again, I think as I said in my opening statement, we have engaged now with the, the independent sector uh, to get as much as their capacity as we practically can so we can get those uh, those patients moved across to any facility uh, that is available and can support them at the current time. So those, those discussions and that accessibility has, has already started and we will start to see patients transfer across to the utilisation of those facilities uh, very shortly. I, I hope it's the piece of work and engagement that has been done. But look, in, in regards to um, and where we come on the same page is about uh, what we're seeing now is the underinvestment um, and our health service and the staff for the last number of years. You know, unfortunately now we are we are paying the price for those decisions um, that were taken and have been taken over the last number of years. Um, we had a, a service uh, that was already under pressure this time last year before we threw a pandemic at it. Uh, and that's been seen across a number of countries as well, not just not just ourselves. So, you know, the challenge I have is making sure that our, our health service and the workers within it are recognised for the valuable contribution um, that they do make to our society, not just even in the terms of the pandemic and, and you know, in terms of workforce. Um, you know, we're what, uh, three days into to over a year since the executive and the assembly was re-established. Uh, one of the, the achievements that, that we had are you know, getting our nurses back off, off, off the picket line, an additional 300 places per year for the next three years uh, for nursing uh, to fill that gap. But you know, it's, it's an investment for the future. It's not, you know, they don't come out here and now uh, to fill the gaps where we currently need them. So that's why, unfortunately, we've had to take those very hard decisions. Uh, to downturn those, those clinical procedures, uh, those, those you know, the cancer surgeries, uh, the diagnostics tests, everything that our health service, everybody, everything that everybody working or in our health service wants to be doing today. They want to be doing their specialities, they want to be doing their day job. Uh, they don't want to have to fight in the pandemic, but you can see the virus is here and they are standing up and they're fighting it on our behalf. But it's about getting our, our service back into a, a fighting fit. Uh, place so that it's not just able to cope with the pandemic and that it's able to deal with the day-to-day issues and stresses and strains that it currently faces. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to move on quickly to Alan, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Minister. I have a number of points here to make. Uh, I'll just run through them and let you answer them all, maybe at, at the end, if you would. Um, just in regard to pharmacists becoming involved in the vaccination programme, which I think is uh, a good idea, Um, Will they uh, be just uh, vaccinating, say, health workers that would be referred by the various trusts, or will they be working in conjunction uh, with local GP practices to uh, assist uh, the GP to work through his his, his patients' lists? Um, Also, uh, all all the staff in the trusts that uh, currently have been vaccinated is that information conveyed back uh, to their GP so that uh, they avoid any duplication, particularly in, in admin, or is it the responsibility of, of, of the, the individual to let their GP know that they have been vaccinated? Um, in regards to uh, calls for uh, certain groups uh, to be uh, brought up the priority list, Minister, um, I accept the, uh, really the advice from the vaccination committee, the joint committee. Uh, I think it is common sense to work through, uh, to work down from the, those groups that have the highest potential, the highest death rates. Um, as regards, uh, the, we all have received a letter from the BMA and it has been referred to this morning. Uh, but I, I think that we have to be careful that uh, we as committee don't ignore uh, all the other expert and professional groups uh, that have been uh, publicly saying that uh, it is the correct approach to to give one injection uh, and get as many people vaccinated with the first uh, injection as possible. Uh, And I do think uh, you have to be careful, and I think you recognise that, Minister, that 
if you do uh, bring one group up the priority list, it will open the floodgates for uh, a lot of other groups uh, to ask for the same facility. Uh, also, Minister, the, the, uh, there have been calls for us to ramp up uh, the vaccination programme to maybe a 24-7 model, uh, and I know that you have uh, that would be an aspiration that the department uh, would share. But you have said that it, it really is determined by availability of the vaccine. Uh, would you anticipate uh, any short periods uh, when vaccinating could slow down because of, of little stock being available? Or are you reasonably confident that the integrity of the batch supply system uh, will be maintained? Um, then, in, in relation to uh, requesting military assistance, Minister, I know that I, I've sort of had a sense over the last few weeks that some people have maybe been implying that uh, your department has been resisting asking for uh, military assistance, but I, I think you've made it very clear this morning uh, that that is most certainly not the case, and I think you have uh, listed uh, the, the, the number of events where the military have assisted uh, over, uh, over right from the start of, of the uh, pandemic. Um, and I, I, I suppose you could maybe confirm to me this morning, Minister, that senior officials in your department have been having ongoing conversations uh, with the Ministry of Defence and keeping in close uh, contact with them as to what help they might be able to offer. In relation to the ambulance service, Minister, Alan, uh, Alan, I'm just just going to give the minister time to come back. I'm just conscious <laughs> he's nearly up. So you've asked about five or six questions there. Could you just one more, and then we'll bring the minister? Yes, in? uh huh. Just uh, in terms of the uh, ambulance drivers, uh, I note, Minister, that you say that uh, uh, some PSNI and fire service drivers are assisting. Uh, but I asked the question of the, I think it would be the Chief Medical Officer of the Ambulance Service a few weeks ago about this, about employing civilian drivers even. But he said that ambulances required a technician and a paramedic. Um, it, does the absence of, of either a technician or a paramedic on an ambulance, does it compromise the service that can be provided by the ambulance? And just finally, uh, Minister. Um, reference has been made to the 10-point plan published recently in the Belfast Telegraph under the name of Professor Scully, who does seem to have uh, some sort of a, a personal crusade at the moment. In fact, some people would actually refer to it as a vendetta. Uh, but I was rather surprised to see uh, the name of Deirdre Heenan. Uh, I, I sort of recognised her as a political commentator uh, rather than as a uh, health expert. Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you, Anna. I'll get through, through some of those points um, as quickly as, as I can. In regards to, to pharmacy supporting our, our, our COVID vaccination thing, what, what we've actually done is actually allow them to pick up more of our flu vaccination programme um, so that we can keep those two programmes uh, running concurrently. And again, the, the challenge comes uh, uh, with actually the, the the management and the, the logistics of the control of COVID vaccines, so the likes of the Pfizer, uh, that has to be stored at minus 70, minus 80, makes it a, a challenge just to get out into the community. So our community pharmacies are, are well engaged. We're talking to them in regards to how they support the wider vaccination program on their part that they're now playing in that flu vaccine, vaccine, vaccination program. Uh, is of a large benefit because it takes additional pressures off our GP practices, which allows them to to, to concentrate on, on the extremely you know, high vulnerability cohorts um, in regards to, to age group that receive the COVID vaccine. In regards to just trying to work through through, through some of these in regards to the groups and, and the priorities, um, we are following them and I've been very clear about this and we're following them as a four nations approach of that JCBI guidance because although I recognise uh, many of the calls that are being made, um, I don't want to get into a situation where vaccine has been deployed because of the loudest voice or because of a political vote uh, in, any, in any arena should have been the executive or the assembly. So I'll always maintain that we follow that JCP. I, I advise in regards to that. And the 24-hour-7 um, demands and supply, I think, that is, as I said earlier, uh, supply and also demand the vaccines. Uh, we'll see where we go in that cohort and that delivery, and possibly when we do get into 
uh, the, the, the lower groups and the mass vaccination programs where we want as many people as possible taking up the, the vaccinations. We will make it as easy as possible for people to access. So we're not at that point yet, but it's not something that we have ruled out. Uh, but due to the current the current programs we have and where we're seeing them actually work, that's work that is on, on board and always be taken uh, into note. Uh, we have to step up, uh, I suppose, the next year and, and make sure we get vaccines as easily accessible uh, to as many people as possible. And in regards to the utilisation of military resourcing, uh, I think I've cleared that. I answered that question in regards to, to Johnny's earlier on. Uh, we are in constant contact with the MOD. We have a, a permanent liaison officer assigned here uh, with the department we have had since the start of this pandemic. So it's about, again, the matching um, of the offer against the need as well. So some of the logistical advice and guidance uh, has been critical in the, the market of the refuse to have to use to transport uh, patients from here to the northeast of England for ECMO. You know, we, we couldn't have done um, without them. In regards to, to the ambulance situation, that's why I specifically referred to earlier on. There will be a small number of PSMI officers and fire brigade officers who are able to, to step forward and supply that uh, additional support to our ambulance services because of the, the criteria and the training that they come with as well. There may be, um, I suppose, a, a reduced delivery of what that ambulance can actually do uh, so that they will be assigned accordingly to the, the competency uh, of the team, but it shouldn't undermine but it's reliant uh, or necessity if they need to call an ambulance that service is there. Uh, in regards then, I think to your final point, to, to the contribution to the Belfast Telegraph, um, I, I, I didn't see it, I didn't read the, the, the half side of it, so I, I can't comment on this content. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Minister. I have just a, a quick follow-up question, but just to let Pam know that I am going to come back to her because she did not get a chance to come back in. Minister, I just want to um, ask you, when was the last time you raised the issue of commissioning abortion services at the Executive and whether you stated here earlier that there is a current paper with them? Thank you. Um, it would have been towards the end of last year, Chair. I do not have the exact uh, the exact date. To, to hand, but it won't be in correspondence to the executive towards the end of last year. Okay, thank you. Pam, do you have a question there or a follow-up, please? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, and just very quickly, yes, Minister, um, I suppose just to say that um, I fully support the um, the priority list for the vaccine. That's uh, just to make that very clear. Um, but I am very concerned, and I know the, the sound quality of this meeting is very poor at the very beginning, because I'm not sure whether the chair got it in, but I'm very concerned about the 200 residents, the very elderly residents of particular homes that are not covered under the Pfizer vaccine rollout um, presently, because those homes uh, don't receive, those individuals don't receive personal care, so washing and dressing and that sort of thing, but they do still have um, shared facilities. So I'm very concerned that, that they're being they're they're falling between cracks where GPs uh, are not necessarily looking after them in terms of the over 80s rollout of the vaccine um, program. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to cut you. I, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Michael, do you want to answer yeah. that specific? Because I know there is work has been done by. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, again, Pam, very good point. I'll just say that we provided uh, in the first communication that we went sent out about the. Um, the vaccine prioritisation prior to Christmas, we indicated in that that those supported living environments, which were close to essentially care home environments, as you described, that they uh, and the assessment of the risk was equivalent uh, to a care home that the, the uh, staff and residents, uh, if that's the, the correct term, in, in those circumstances would be vaccinated. A number of them have been. I don't have those figures with me, but it is based on the an individual assessment of the risk. Those closest to the care home environment, given the level of interaction, shared accommodation, et cetera, et cetera, as you describe, uh, those will be vaccinated. Under Pfizer? Uh, yes, using the mobile teams, yes. Okay, that's, that's really have, good news, have, thank you. I just don't have the numbers with me. Oh, okay, and Michael, just very quickly then, maybe you can answer this one as well, and it's around, um, can you confirm where the carers, including unpaid carers are, on that vaccine list, and that's in partic particular carers who are looking after um, people who are clinically extremely vulnerable. 
Yeah, I, mean, I can confirm that if they, I know it's very hard to look on the JCPI list, but if you look at the list, they're included in priority group six, which are those uh, uh, you know, with underlying health conditions clinically extremely vulnerable between six uh, teen years of age and over up to the age of 64. And it's very clear that within that, it's advised that consideration is given to uh, carers who are in receipt of carers or allowance or others who are caring for elderly uh, individuals, those with disability, et cetera. So those individuals would be expecting to receive their vaccine in February. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam. And, and Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Minister and Chief Medical Officer, thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, I think we all got a lot out of it and just want to wish you well going forward. Thank you. Chair, thank you, and congratulations on, on chairing the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Okay, members, um, have we any um, thoughts on that? Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just a couple of points. Uh, one being, obviously, members have a lot of questions surrounding the vaccine programme, understandably, and the JCVI and prioritisation. And, and I think members will all have their own thoughts as to um, how that should be rolled out. I know we have Patricia Donnelly with us next week. Could I suggest that we make a request, given the seriousness of the issue, that Patricia appear in person to the committee? Because I have watched, and I'm sure as other members have, how the difficulty with the communication link, whether it's at the Department of Health or otherwise, enables the conversation. It can flow. Uh, I, I certainly didn't pick up a lot of my questioning okay. with the minister. So I, I would ask that we make the specific request that given the, the urgent nature of this, okay. that Patricia uh, attends in person. We, we can make that, I think. Okay, any other feedback? But just, uh, just on that point, sure. I mean, uh, 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 I accept what Jonathan said. I thought today the sound was, at, at the start, it did improve. Mm -hmm. But certainly at the start, it was like every other word you were, it was dropping out. And I'm sure we all experienced, I thought it was maybe just my old hearing, but I think everybody was experiencing it. Um, but I think we have to be cognizant of uh, the fact that we are encouraging people to work from home, that the regulations are, that they should work from home. Uh, and that's, that's a clear health message that's gone out from the department and surely we should be supporting that. Um, and I know that the minister uh, last week uh, did allude in the chamber to he had thoughts that perhaps the, the, the whole system within the assembly chamber would need to change and it would have to be more sort of remote input uh, from the members to avoid you know, bringing people into this building and bringing them from their home. And I know that the House of Commons operates that way and does seem to be able, that they don't seem to have the sound dropping out or anything, they okay. seem to be able. So the, 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 there's technical problems that, that somebody should be able to, I mean, they were able to 50 years ago uh, uh, bring broadcasts from the, the moon to earth, you know, so uh, I think we should be able to, to get somebody from Castle Biltons to, uh, to storm it without the, the sound being distorted in the way that it is. So okay. just, I would just caution that, uh, I mean, I, 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 I absolutely prefer people sitting at the top of that uh, table where you can really eyeball people and, and read body language and everything else, but just just be cautious okay. that we're not, uh, we're not accused of, of of breaching our, our, the, the, the message that we're putting out about okay. working from home. So noted, thank you. Pam, you've indicated to come in. Yeah, thanks, Chair. No, it was just to contribute to that. I mean, I, I look, at, I'm on remotely for, for very personal reasons today as well. I couldn't be there in person. So I'm just very cognizant that, you know, it doesn't matter how important the subject is or how important that person's evidence is there may be very valid reasons behind why they cannot attend in person. So just think we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, whites, yes, request if possible, if they can yeah. appear um, in person, that's good, but it may not um, always be poss possible. I just want to say, um, Chair, I really welcome that um, clarification given there by Michael McBride around those 200 residents um, in the kind of non-traditional care home settings mm -hmm. um, I think that's really really good news we've been we've been trying to get that information and that's quite clear today so um, I think that's just really welcome news because obviously those are 200 very elderly um, people living in Northern Ireland who have been really left out of the system until now so I think it's just that's really good news yeah I, I would echo that thank you okay and members I'm going to move on um, so our members can attend to note the Minister's correspondence regarding advice to clinically extremely vulnerable people at tab 5.2 of the pack and the update on the vaccine rollout at tab um, 5.4 of your Great. table papers. Great.
Great. Thank okay. you. Mm-hmm. Okay, are members also content to note the correspondence from the BMA and tabled papers at tab 5.5 and the statement from the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges at tab 5.6? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Um, Members, I'm going to take a short break. Um, It's uh, now um, just come up to 11. If we come back here at 10 past 11. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Um, okay. Okay, members, we will now move on to the consideration of the five statutory rules regarding coronavirus restrictions. I refer members to tabs 6 to 10 of the pack, including the clerk's memo at tab 6.1. All five of these SRs are subject to confirmatory resolution. In her report yesterday, the examiner of statutory rules drew attention to drafting errors in SRs 2020-343 and 346 items 8 and 9, but advised that the Department has undertaken to correct them at the earliest opportunity. No other issues were raised. The Department has indicated that it hopes to bring these SRs to plenary during the week commencing 25th of January. I can advise members that officials from the Department of Health are here to brief the Committee on the regulations and to take questions. We will then take each SR in turn. Sorry, we will then consider each SR in turn. So may I welcome um, Ms Liz uh, Redmond, Director of Population Health, and Ms Marion McKeever, Health Protection Branch. Um, they're here to um, brief the committee. Are you, are you ready to go ahead? Thank you. Yes, I can hear us. We're on the phone as we couldn't get our um, video to work. Yeah, so yeah. I think someone's just got it to work now. So we're, we're in the wrong room, unfortunately. Uh, we could move if you'd like us to. No, I think, I think, we, it's, I think it's nice and clear. I think it, we'll, we'll go ahead um, over the phone. Thank you. But sorry, but when, okay. when you're, sorry, when you're speaking, could you indicate which of you are, are speaking? Thank you. Sure. So Liz Redman um, leading off. Um, so um, I, I'll just do a, an introduction, if that's OK. Um, uh, Shall I start? Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank, thanks for inviting us today um, to the committee. Um, we're considering uh, numbers 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23 amendments uh, to the coronavirus restriction number two regulations. Um, my approach was going to be to briefly summarise all five of them um, and take them all together, if that's okay with you. Yes, thank you. 
Okay, um, so I was going to start today with setting out the context of where we were when the first of the five sets of amendment regulations we're discussing today were made because many changes have occurred since then and I thought we perhaps should go back to where we were at that time. Um, so a period of tighter restrictions which had commenced in mid-October was just coming to an end. The regulations as amended up to and including the number 18 amendment placed restrictions on hospitality in all forms that includes pubs, restaurants, cafes and so forth, non-essential retail, close contact economy including driving instructors, places of worship, indoor activity centres and attractions, most outdoor activity centres and attractions, sport, gyms and leisure, domestic gatherings and large gatherings. So the default position on the 11th of December would have been to revert approximately to the situation in law as it existed in mid-October. Following the assessment of the disease situation and modelling of the potential for the epidemic to increase as soon as restrictions were relaxed, the executive agreed to allow a certain degree of reopening on the 11th of December, but in some areas to regulate the tighter restrictions that those that existed before mid-October. Just to summarise again, just to help you to, to remember where we were back then, um, what the executive agreed um, for the 11th of December onwards was that non-essential businesses would reopen, including non-essential retail, close contact services, driving instructors and so on. Most of hospitality would reopen, with the exception of traditional non-food pubs. Hotels and guest houses would reopen. Um, there would still be some restrictions on indoor sporting activity, but outdoor sporting activity would largely reopen, although with limits on numbers. There would be absolute maximum of 500 in terms of numbers gathering. Places of worship would reopen. Um, there were a list of leisure and entertainment venues that could reopen, including museums and libraries. What would be left closed would be those traditional non-food pubs, which I just mentioned, concert halls and theatres, conference centres and nightclubs. Restrictions on household gatherings would also remain in place except for some exceptions around Christmas, which we'll come to. So that was basically what was agreed that then was made into regulation for these number 19 amendments initially. So I'll now turn to each of those amendment regulations in turn. So if we start with SR 2020-323, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 19 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, was made at 8 p.m. on the 10th of December and came into operation at one minute past midnight on the 11th of December. This regulation introduced the following. Seating requirements for unlicensed premises which had previously been in place for licensed premises only, that is that no more than six persons should be seated per table and less from a single household, not including children under 12, oh, sorry, 12 or under, with a maximum of two households per table. A requirement for unlicensed premises to keep customer information, a measure previously only in place for licensed premises, and some changes to the information required, including um, a requirement for the name and telephone number of each person under the age of 16, uh, sorry, age 16 or above to be collected. An upper limit of 500 persons on an outdoor gathering are organised or operated by a responsible person where a risk assessment has been carried out. A right of appeal to a court against a premises improvement notice or a prohibition notice. Amendments to requirements in relation to sporting events so that the person responsible for organising or operating the gathering considers the risks related to those outside the venue who are entering and leaving the venue. Sporting, outdoor sporting events were largely uh, permitted, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, restrictions on indoor sporting events were eased um, to permit individual training, one-to-one -one training, or training by an individual and their carers. It also introduced the upper limit of 500 spectators on organised sporting events. Requirements for uh, those providing close contact services uh, were that they must see clients by appointment system only and again a requirement to obtain, record and retain information of their customers, the date and time of the service provided. 
Uh, there was a removal of restrictions on the opening of non-essential retail businesses. Uh, there were amendments to requirements on operating hours of hospitality services. And the regulations reverted to the mid-October restrictions relating to places of worship, marriages, civil partnerships, funerals and committals. So if I move now to the second amendment regulations we're discussing today, that SR 2020-335, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 20 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, was made at 7 p.m. on the 16th of December 2020 and came into operation at the same time and day as made. This regulation made the following changes. Amendment to the requirement for review of these regulations to allow extra time for data to become available after the Christmas holidays. Amendment to the period a person must wait before forming a new linked household down to 10 days from 14 days to reflect the changes in self-isolation period. Um, these regulations permitted a supermarket to use a till or checkout aisle for intoxicating liquor off sales. That's any till or checkout aisle. This was to allow customers to use all aisles and reduce congestion and overcrowding in supermarkets. And there were also some minor corrections and technical amendments also in the regulations to permit the continued operation of business financial support schemes. So if I move now to the third uh, set of amendment regulations that we're discussing today, that's SR 2020-343, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 21, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, were made at 7 p.m. on the 17th of December 2020 and came into operation at the same time and day they were made. These regulations provide clarity on what constitutes a single gathering if entertainment is provided in a venue and inserts a definition of entertainment for the purposes of the regulations. Essentially, in an indoor venue, each table, each group at a table is considered to be a separate gathering. That's if no entertainment is provided. However, all persons in a room are considered to be a single gathering if entertainment is provided. So moving now to the fourth set of amendment regulations we're considering today, that's SR 2020-346, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment 22 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, were made at 7 p.m. on the 18th of December and came into operation at the same time and day as they were made. These regulations provide for extended linked households at Christmas to reflect the guidance on three bubbles meeting over Christmas. Uh, allow, and they allowed the use of conference facilities by courts and tribunals and corrected some previous errors in the regulation. Finally, uh, the fifth of the amendment regulations we're considering today is SR 2023-52, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 23, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, were made at 2 p.m. on the 23rd of December 2020 and came into operation at the time and on the date they were made. These regulations limited a Christmas bubble to one day and prohibited overnight stays connected to Christmas bubble. Okay, well, look, that was all I was going to say about the detail of the regulations. I'm happy to take any questions um, that members may have. Of course, members will be aware that the scope of these regulations is far-reaching across the responsibilities of all executive departments. So this, if we're unable to provide clarification or answer your questions, we'll certainly seek that clarification from our colleagues subsequent to the meeting and give you feedback. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I have some questions here. Um, I'm then going to bring Pam in, but if any other members want to indicate, I'll, I'll bring them in after Pam. Okay, my first question is around, um, you know, we've talked uh, very much as a committee about the urgency with which these um, regulations and amendments, should I say, are being developed and the lack of impact assessment and consultation in advance. So what can you tell us about any progress in doing post hoc impact assessments to learn for future and further regulatory changes? Thank you. 
Okay, thank you for your question. Um, I would say, first of all, that there has been an awful lot of consultation um, across government and with the sectors impacted during the development of these uh, amendments. I'd say we've got better at that through the year. Um, we, we have a lot of amendments that we've made, as you're very well aware, um, and we, we have got good uh, connections with the sectors that we're regulating in this area. So I would say um, we have developed good methods there for stakeholder engagement um, with, the, with the lead departments. Um, in terms of assessing the impact um, that we have had, we, we actually, uh, I think, are in an ongoing process of review there. And as we come now into, uh, I think, a cycle where with, uh, with the disease um, being brought under control by current restrictions, we're going to be back to where we were in the springtime. We're certainly looking back and learning from what we did, how we did it, what impact we had at that time with changes we made to the regulatory regime. That's a constant and continuous process that we're in. Okay, thank you. Um, just, just to come back on that quickly then, will you be able to share that review um, when it's been completed? Um, look, well, look, this is something that we can take away um, and, and consider what we could share with you. Um, ultimately, I think what you'll find it is going to play out in how we, um, how we approach it in, in the next few months. Um, uh, so it's, it's more like a continuous process rather than a p specific review as such with a report that I think you might have in mind. Okay. Um, but I can certainly take away the request that anything we do um, produce might be shared. Okay, thank you. But my second question then is, um, you know, what, what, what are we learning about the particular regulations um, and restrictions that were put in just prior to Christmas then and then around the Christmas bubbling arrangements in terms of impact? Okay, well, I think what, what we are um, seeing now is, is clearly the impact of, of relaxations that we're talking about today. I think that might be where you're coming from, is that right? Yep. Yes, please. Thanks. Yes, and um, you know clearly um, with this disease, we know it spreads through contact between people, and that there's a constant balancing act here between allowing our economy and our society to progress and function, and preventing people being in contact with each other um, to stop further spread. So that, that's a constant balancing act that's being done, as, as you're very well aware from having discussed this at length over the past year. Um, so I, I think at the time when we uh, brought in the number 19 re regulations, um, the disease was um, con under control in the sense that we had got uh, the R number below one for hospital admission. There was a significant reduction in the number of cases. And obviously the judgment at that time was that it was um, uh, it was appropriate to to make some relaxations to allow the economy and society to function in the lead up to Christmas. And then there had been a long-standing desire for um, a, 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 a way to allow families to plan um, to gather in a limited way um, over Christmas. So, um, however, because we are dealing with a virus that is still very much present in our community. We know that when we relax measures that prevent people getting together, we're going to have virus transmission. And that is what's playing out now. Um, whether that was the correct judgment or not at the time is, you know, you know, is a matter for, for history and depends where, where you sit on this. But um, that's certainly why um, the last of these restrictions that we're talking about was brought in because I, which was in fact to limit the uh, Christmas bubble to one day in the uh, period of five. Um, because already, I guess at that time and leading up to Christmas, uh, the there was an awareness, um, or well, the metrics were showing us that the disease was spreading again. We also had the situation in the southeast of England that was extremely concerning. Um, and I think all um, of the administrations in, in the UK were very concerned about that 
uh, which, which led to across the UK measures to restrict the Christmas bubbling arrangement. So the, the fifth of these five is actually reflecting a response to the data that we were watching. Okay. Okay, and just finally for me then, um, what, what, what is your assessment of the levels of comp compliance with these um, regulations? Well, I think there's ongoing concerns about that, it's fair to say, and there's very active discussions ongoing uh, with, with various groups and at various levels of, of government, um, local government, and with the sectors themselves about compliance. Um, so the approach has always been um, to start with education and um, to take the approach that we do not want to be um, heavy handed in this area. But there is a lot of concern about that and I know that um, the behavioural aspects of it are under consideration by various academics and groups because um, that interplay between what you put in law, how you communicate it, and how people respond to that is is not necessarily predictable. So um, I think you know it, it's it's is a concern, um, and it is something that is under active consideration in government. Okay. Well, th thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to bring Pam in now, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Liz, and your team uh, for being here today at the committee. Um, just a couple of quick questions, really. Um, the first one would be, and I've mentioned this before, is around um, whether has there been consideration given to when you're um, wording these regulations and requiring um, information to be gathered in terms of contact tracing, and I think in particular of um, restaurants and, and that type of um, venue, uh, when there are restrictions in regard to numbers that can sit at tables and um, how many households can sit at one table, that type of thing. And I'm just very concerned that it, it never seemed to have come in, and I don't know why that's the case, that, that we would be requesting um, postal basic information as to where people live. Uh, and as, as a kind of a a form of challenge, which is not really a hard challenge, but it maybe would um, allow people to question their own actions if, if you're actually asking not just for their name, and telephone number, but actually for their postal address, which actually points out, um, you know, how many households are actually having at one table. So that would be my first question, and the second one would be in around um, Amendment 19, it introduced a right of appeal against a premises improvement notice or a pro prohibition notice. Is that mechanism still available and has um, the power ever been used to challenge enforcement? Thank you uh, very much for your questions. Um, on the first of those, um, we did increase the requirement for visitor information. Um, it, name and telephone number for persons aged 16 and above. Um, now, and, and it's a date of visiting and, and uh, the arrival time, um, the number from each household as well. Now, the purpose of gathering this information is a public health one, which is to be able to trace these people if there are uh, infected people on the premises in future if you find there's been infected people, can you backward trace um, to other people who were in the same room, for instance. Um, so that is the purpose for gathering that information. Um, so I think the issue of whether the people who are sitting at the table are from no more than two households is, is a separate question. Um, and at, at the moment, we haven't taken a heavy-handed approach to that. We have expected people to, um, to do their bit, quite frankly, and be honest and responsible in this way. After all, it is protecting them um, uh, that we do this for, as well as protecting others in the room and society. So um, I hope that answers the first of your questions. 
Uh, on okay, the, sorry, could, yeah. could, could I just come back on that? Um, it's just that, I mean, obviously it, it doesn't really answer it and that, you know, asking for an additional piece of information in legislation I think would be helpful and would challenge, you know, us as individuals ourselves as to what our, as to our actions. So I, I don't see that as being heavy handed and I have raised it uh, on a number of occasions. So I think it would be some, something it, it should be considered and I would appreciate if you could take that back. Um, just going forward, I think as well as that, you know, there's always a chance somebody put their phone number down wrong as well. To have that additional piece of information, I think would be would be useful even for, for tracking and tracing. Thank you. Yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll do as you're, you suggest and, and note it and, and take it away um, for, for consideration. Uh, the, the second of your questions, I'm not sure I can answer it. Would you mind just repeating it so I can just be sure, sure of that? Yeah, okay, so it was Amendment 19, which introduced a right of appeal against a premises improvement notice or a prohibition notice. And I was asking if that mechanism is still available and has the power ever been used to challenge enforcement? Right, yeah, I will have to take that one away, I'm afraid. I, I don't have the information to hand, but, but we can come back to you on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to Jonathan, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, could I ask which of these amendments currently apply and how many have been replaced by recent executive decisions? Um, Liz, did you catch that question? Uh, uh, yes, yes, I, I did. I think um, it's very uh, complex, but I would say that um, the restrictions that were brought in um, on the for, that commenced on the 26th of December have have to a very large degree um, uh, overwritten these regulations um, and I think one of the considerations of course is that where, where we go back to 19 and this is why I did uh, uh, spend a bit of time uh, on, on the context at the beginning of my introduction there because we were we were in such a different place um, 19 was all about letting things happen um, and reopening whereas where we are now is is the other side of the cycle so uh, even before Christmas and at the time that the uh, fifth of these five was made we were already um, drafting the regulations uh, that were to come in the very next, uh, that were to be made the very next day, actually the 24th, for the 26th, which uh, in fact closed a lot of the activities down that the regulations in number 19 uh, relate to. So it, it is quite a different place, and I do appreciate that, that it's quite difficult to, to make that leap, but um, I hope that helps to, to explain it to you. Okay, yes, thank you. And, and could I ask, what was the intent behind the changes to entertainment venues? Uh, weren't these settings already subject to regulations and restrictions? Again, I think it's more about the fact that these regulations that we're discussing today reopened um, those venues and now they're shut. Okay, thank you. Um, can I, before I bring Jerry in, I just wanted to um, raise an issue that really occurred to me at the weekend. I was uh, spent a lot of time sort of trying to clarify for constituents around the um, changes to the restrictions. Um, the, the current information online is not that clear, and, and we are legislators, and if it's not clear for us, then it's probably even more difficult for people who work in different spheres. Is there any way that we can have a, a really tightly updated um, uh, law or sorry um, piece of information around where we are with everything because you have to jump between different schedules you have to jump them back to the guidance and list them that come off it is there anywhere that everything is all in one place is basically my question um, th there's actually two places so there's there's the information on NI direct which is sort of just on and on web pages but we also in in the Department of Health um, publish uh, a, a detailed guide and it is actually a document that you have to click on and open it it's on the Department of Health website though I think there's a link that takes you to it from NI Director I'd have to double check that um, but uh, our guide is a, a substantial document actually so um, 
it, it won't address your request for brevity, but then I think it's almost impossible to sum this up very quickly um, because of the complexity and the reach of these regulations, which really touch on all aspects of, of life. Um, but yeah, I, if you like, we could send you the link. Um, we have uh, the most recent update um, is, is right up to date, actually, the, the 8th of January. Um, there was a time um, during December where we had these very rapid changes where we, we just weren't able to keep up. But we, we do have this published. It is also um, over the year that's gone, we've um, had it translated into uh, quite a number of languages of our ethnic minor minority groups who are in, in this country. So, um, and we do find people do look at them. So we at one point just did an assessment of how often these documents are looked at and they definitely are looked enough, uh, enough for us to uh, continue to put the energy into um, updating them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I don't necessarily want to labour it as such, but um, sometimes it will say omit this, put this, af this appears after this. I think even just the language within it, obviously it's necessary, but I think that it, it can be very difficult and say sometimes you do have to jump into other documents. But if you could send us that link, then um, I'll make sure that that is circulated to people. Okay, Jerry, would you like to come in, please? Yeah, th thanks, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes, th yes thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, just two questions uh, around to the SR. So the first uh, question is around uh, SR 2323. Uh, um, I mean, this obviously uh, detailed uh, the removal of restrictions and non-essential retail services, which I think was a was a mistake. And a lot of people warned um, about the risks of doing so about how the virus would spread and, and cases would, would shoot up. Uh, and I know that the Minister um, expressed some regret uh, in an interview with the Belfast Telegraph uh, either today or, or yesterday. Uh, so first question is, what, what assessment has the Department uh, done to ensure that that strategy, that path uh, of opening things up uh, prematurely will not be embarked upon again? Um, yeah, I think it, it links to something I was saying earlier. I think we're in a constant process of, of uh, review, in fact. Um, we, we know, uh, or, or sorry, you, you will know that uh, we have a modelling group that the chief scientist oversees, and they update their modelling every week. Um, so they're able to see what is going on as a result of um, measures that were taken three or four weeks prior, well, depending on whether you're looking at cases, hospitalizations, or death, but um, uh, in terms of the, the hospitalizations, um, you know, it's some weeks to feed through, which is what we're seeing now from December, from these very sets of, of restriction, of regulation, sorry, um, that we're discussing today. Um, so we, we are learning from it. Um, I would say this is not an exact science, and I'm sure you've sat through enough of these conversations to fully appreciate that. Everybody is learning. Around the whole globe, we're learning at the moment, um, and it's not, we're not always going to get it perfectly correct. But as I said earlier on in, in this conversation, it's a very difficult balance that's having to be struck all the time um, between uh, allowing people to get on with their lives and preventing people from uh, transferring the virus to other people. So um, yes, we are learning. That's that's uh, that's absolutely the case. Okay, uh, th thanks for the answer. And, and I know it's not your primarily your responsibility, uh, but the fact that we're almost a year into this um, pandemic and we're repeating the executive is repeating mistakes and uh, not learning from best practice around countries where. There is a return to quote unquote normality uh, in some senses, and, and we're a made a minds away from that. So I, I think more work needs to be done rather than to repeat the mistakes of the past, and um, that rather than rush it to lift restrictions when it's far, far too soon. And we shouldn't be wasting this uh, lockdown, this essential lockdown, um, because it would be uh, detrimental to people. Uh, the final question um, is on uh, SR twenty three two six. Uh, two, two parts to it. Um, the amendment around self-isolation from 14 to 10 days 
Um, can you clarify if that's just for people traveling uh, and traveling from, from Britain or is that for, uh, for everybody who has a notification? Uh, and also, uh, there are obviously several exemptions uh, in this regulation, uh, including for people working on, on t television. Uh, my understanding is this is much more uh, far reaching than other uh, jurisdictions where uh, there's exemptions for people engaging in uh, public service broadcasting, but the, the regulation here uh, are open to a far greater number of people. Uh, and my concern is that it, this could put more people uh, out uh, of the workplace, sorry, out of the home when they're told to be uh, staying at home uh, and less essential. So do we have any assessment of the number of workers and people and individuals affected by those um, sectoral exemptions? Thank you. Yeah, I think there's, there's two things going on here, and and possibly the the second part of your um, your question is, is uh, something that needs to be addressed through the um, uh, scrutiny sessions on the international travel regulations, um, particularly. But um, this this self isolation for travel within you're talking about within the the UK and Common Travel Area is that correct? Well, well, the regulation states that uh, the self-isolation period is, is reducing from 14 to 10 days. So I'm, I'm just trying to clarify, is that for people um, traveling from Britain to Ireland or, or who does that apply to? Um, okay, no, I'm just trying to ascertain because there's quite a few different things intersecting here. And I think this um, amendment, so let's just be clear, this amendment is about Liz. the amount of time that um, a, a household needs to um, wait before it links with a different household. So I think there's there's different ways this self isolation is applying. Um, so in, in this particular case, the amendment that we're talking about today, it's about the length of time that a household, if it wants to rebubble with a different linked household, it needs to wait that length of time. It's no longer 14 days; it's 10 days, which aligns with the self-isolation periods that you've actually started to talk about which aren't the subject of this um this amendment um sorry 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 Ger um jerry and liz may I jump in um we're actually going to be getting on to those amendments um after so i think that's probably where we're at a bit cross wires no problem. Sorry. apologies Okay, um, members, I haven't seen any other um, indications to come in at this point. Or, are we content? Content. Yep. Okay, well, um, I just want to thank um, Liz and Marion for your time today and preparing for committee and for all your work you have done in terms of this. But um, just for now, I would just I'd like to thank you and uh, wish you the very best of luck going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, members, we will now consider each of the statutory, statutory rules in turn. Um, the first one, SR 2020 323. I refer members to tab six of the pack. This uh, SR amends restrictions on gatherings, introduces requirements to, uh, for close contact services and on licensed premises, and removes restrictions on non essential retail, places of worship, marriages, and civil partnerships funerals and libraries. It also introduces a right of appeal to the court against the premises, improvement notice or a prohibition notice, and makes other consequential amendments and minor amendments and um, corrects errors. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? If not, I, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee of Health has considered SR 2020-323, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment 19, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and re recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay. Okay, turning now to um, SR 2020-335, sorry, 335. Um, just, just want to check with the clerk, Dave, read out then in terms of the background. I'll just move on. Okay. I can remind members that this SR um, amends the requirement for review of these regulations, amends the, pe uh, the period a person must wait before forming a new linked household from 14 days to 10 days, 
permits a supermarket to use any till or checkout aisle for intoxicating liquor off sales and makes technical amendments to permit the continued operation of business financial support schemes. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to formally agree um, that the Committee for Health has considered Statutory Rule 2020-335, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 20, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Okay. Turning then to Statutory Rule 2020-343, I refer members to papers at tab 8 of the pack. This statutory rule makes provisions in relation to entertainment venues. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered Statutory Rule 2020-343, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 21, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Okay. Statutory Rule 2020-346. This statutory rule makes provision for extended linked households at Christmas between 23rd to 27th of December and for use of conference facilities for courts and tribunals. The remaining provisions um, correct errors. Have members any issues they wish to raise in relation to this statutory rule? If not, um, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered Statutory Rule 2020-346, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 22, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Okay, and um, turning lastly to Statutory Rule 2020-353, and I refer members to tab 10 of the pack. Um, members, this is a statutory rule that limited a Christmas bubble to one day and disallowed overnight stays connected to a Christmas bubble. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection to this statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered Statutory Rule 2020-352, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 23, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Okay. Um, okay, so members, um, we're now going to consider three um, statutory rules regarding travel restrictions. And I refer members to tabs 11 to 13 of the pack, including the clerk's memo at tab 11.1. 11, um, 11 All these statutory rules are subject to negative resolution. In her report yet yesterday, the examiner of statutory rules highlighted that all three were laid in breach of the 21-day rule, but advised that she is consent that, content that the explanation given by the department the examiner further drew attention to a drafting error in SR 2020-326, item 12, but advised that the department has undertaken to correct it at the earliest opportunity. I can advise members that an official from the Department of Health is here to brief the committee on the regulations and to take questions. We will then consider each SR in turn. May I welcome um, by video link Ms Elaine Colgan, who is Chief of Staff to the Chief Nursing Officer. Are you there? Elaine. Okay. Um, well, uh, would you like to come ahead and brief the committee, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, so, as members of the committee will be aware, uh, the international travel regulations are reviewed weekly, and this is primarily to review the list of countries on the exemption list from self-isolation, and we do use these weekly reviews to make other changes as necessary. So the three regulations under discussion today are primarily, primarily related to changes to the travel corridor list. So regulation 344, which was amendment number 26, um, omitted Namibia, Uruguay and the US Virgin Islands from the travel corridor list given an increase in the risk rating. Similarly, regulation 326, which was amendment number 25, um, had a decrease in the risk rating for Botswana and Saudi Arabia and they were added to the exemption list. Uh, which meant the travellers did not need to self-isolate from those uh, two countries when they arrived. Uh, and the same regulation, 326, Canary Islands were omitted from the list, um, and uh, those uh, people were then required to self-isolate. 
This SR also made changes to the sectoral exemptions from self-isolation, which are those which apply to a person due to their work. For the most part, these exemptions only allow a person to leave self-isolation for the work purposes, and when they're not in work, they should be self-isolating. And we included in this regulation a new exemption for persons involved in high-end TV production, similar to the previous film exemption that we had in place, and a new exemption for accredited journalists. Uh, as the chair has highlighted, there was an error in this amendment, and we will um, correct that uh, very quickly. Amendments to the sports exemptions were also applied in this regulation for newly signed elite athletes. We also introduced an enforcement mechanism for those who failed to pay a fixed penalty notice. Uh, this was not done originally, and that was intentional, as it was uh, deemed that we would I hope that a light force, a light touch enforcement regime would be sufficient, um, but that has proven that we need a bit more of an intensive enforcement regime, and so that was introduced in December. The final policy change made by uh, this regulation was a reduction in the self-isolation period from 14 days down to 10 days, and that was in line with the reduction of the self-isolation period for a close contact of a positive case, which was also reduced to 10 days at the same time. And that was a UK-wide point by all CMOs following a review of the evidence. As a consequence of this policy change, the regulations regarding the provision of information to passengers by operators also had to be amended, and that was the final SR that I'm here this morning to discuss, which was 325. And that reflected, that amended the information that needed to be provided to make it clear to passengers that the self-isolation period was now 10 days and not 14. So that's the summary of the three regulations up today and I'm happy to take any questions on that. Okay, thank you. And just for the record, I think I, I gave your job title incorrectly there, Elaine. It's Chief of Staff, <laughs> Chief Medical Officer. So thank you very much for that. I have just a couple of quick questions and then I'm going to bring Jerry, sorry, Jonathan and then Jerry in and any other members. Oh, I see um, Orlea and Pam on the phone. We'll come to them as well. Okay, so in terms of the reduction in the self-isolation period from 14 to 10 days, um, how does this compare with the World Health Organization's advice and practice elsewhere? So um, the, the, the scientific advice to, for that reduction was considered for the two sets of self-isolation period together, and it was around uh, the, the evidence that was available on when a person is infectious. Um, and I, I, Ian Young will probably be the best person to provide more detail on this. So if you want more uh, scientific information, I'm happy to get that from him and to provide uh, the committee with that. Um, but generally, um, it was about when the person is likely to be spreading the virus and uh, the fact that 10 days was, was a more appropriate um, period for capturing the vast majority of those cases. Okay, thank you. And my second question then would be, um, can you update us on any progress in resolving the north-south data sharing issues that we've re previously raised here at committee? Thank you. Um, yes, so the minister um, has obviously uh, has this as a priority and has written again to his counterpart in the south just yesterday. Um, so we have some uh, agreement, well, maybe agreement is too strong, but we, we do hope that we will be able to get uh, agreement to share the information um, for limited purposes with the South, and we continue to work, official, work with officials to get that. Um, we don't have the information sharing arrangements in place as yet, and we continue to look on our, on our side on what we would do if we did have it, so that if we were to get the information, we would be ready to quickly uh, react and to use it as, as we need to. Um, so, so there isn't really too much more I can say on that, unfortunately, at this point. Okay, well, thank you, but I would appreciate if you could keep the committee updated on, on that work. Thank you. Certainly, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going now to Jonathan, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Elaine, for, for coming today. Could you answer the question, is China on the approved um, travel list to Northern Ireland? Gosh, you're testing me now, Jonathan. Um, I'm, I honestly don't know all of the, I'd need to check on, on NI Direct. Um, I, I suspect it probably isn't, it's probably one where you need to self-isolate, but I, I couldn't give you a firm answer without looking it up. My understanding is that it wouldn't be. Uh, and I suppose probably it leads me on to my question. Um, just at the weekend, it was brought to my attention that Queen's University had taken a decision to charter a flight to bring Chinese students from, from Beijing to Belfast. Now, given the situation that we're in at present, there's been much conversation surrounding international travel. Um, we've seen our own schools closed. We've seen children being homeschooled. 
We have seen universities providing the majority of their uh, interactions online. Um, could you say whether or not you feel that it is appropriate, uh, or the department's view on whether it is appropriate as to whether chartering such a flight to Northern Ireland in the midst of where we are present is acceptable? What interactions would an institution like Queen's University have with the Department of Health or indeed the PHA on a significant issue such as this? Could you maybe uh, answer this? Yeah, um, certainly. So uh, I, I guess it, it would be up for Queen's to, just to decide if that was appropriate or not, and it wouldn't be something that we would give a definitive view on. Um, they, obviously, anyone who is travelling to Northern Ireland, whether whether that's on a chartered flight or whether that's through commercial travel, um, we'd, we'd need to make sure that they comply with any guidance when they get here, any public health advice, and the, that they self-isolate if indeed that is, is required for the countries from which they've come. Well, is such... And in terms of... Sorry, going ahead. Sorry. I was just going to answer your, your final point about interaction with Queen's and PHA. and. Um, I, I know that there are contacts uh, made between those two organisations, and I would imagine that they have uh, discussed any mitigations that might be in place, although I wouldn't have been party to those conversations myself. In, in line with your understanding of the restrictions and regulations that are in place, is such travel arrangements deemed necessary? So, um, the department doesn't... For international travel, we don't, in regulation, say what is essential travel or what is not. That is done by guidance, and it's up to each um, person travelling to determine if they believe that their travel is necessary. Um, the, it, it, within the domestic situation in Northern Ireland, obviously we have a stay-at-home message, which is, is clear in the guidance, and only essential travel within Northern Ireland, but there is no provision within the international travel regulations itself to prohibit travel in any particular circumstances, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, so, so what safety uh, precautions or arrangements would be put in place for such an arrangement? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm cautious of the fact that you might not have that to hand, uh, but that's certainly something that would be of considerable uh, concern to, to both me as a committee member and indeed the larger, wider public. Um, yeah, so the, in terms of the requirements, you, fly, you highlighted the first, which would be if any self-isolation is required, then obviously guidance and arrangements would need to be in place for all of the passengers on that flight if that was needed. Um, the other safety arrangements would probably be more along the public health guidance, and as, as, you, as you flagged, that, that wouldn't really be my strength. So if, if you would like us to, we can um, liaise with public health colleagues and just get a bit, of a, a bit more information for committee members yeah, as no. to what mitigations might be put in place in such a scenario. I feel this is an issue of, of great public concern, given where we are at present and in line with uh, the decision that has closed many of our schools and indeed universities' face-to-face -face interaction, why we would see it appropriate that Queen's University of Belfast could charter a flight to bring in students to Northern Ireland to potentially uh, isolate uh, within halls, I would take it, to provide that online learning from a, a, a hall in, in Belfast as opposed to doing it remotely from Beijing. Uh, so I would appreciate that if the department could look into this particular issue and come back to the committee with a wholesome uh, answer in relation to uh, the restrictions on how it applies and the safety precautions therefore uh, held within. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, um, thank you. I'm going now to Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Are you okay? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Elaine. Um, yeah, just just the the amendment around the self isolation period. Just a a, a clarity on that's for people travelling from uh, from Britain to, to the north, or is that for everybody? And I think um, it's no means a, a big ado, Elaine, but I think it's not good enough for, for us as a committee uh, to be told that there's there's evidence sort of out there, uh, but we're not provided with the rationale um, to reduce the isolation period. It may well be in line with best practice. Um, it may well be safe, but I think uh, to be blunt about it, I think we can't take the word of the department uh, uh, for that. We need to see and need to be explained the, the rationale for that. Um, so just a point on that. Um, just just two final points. Um, the sectoral uh, exemptions. Um, I mean, my understanding is there's 
a greater remit for people working in TV um, to essentially to work outside their, their home uh, with this regulation than there is in another uh, in Britain and potentially the South uh, as well. Do we, do we know how many people um, are affected by this regulation? Because I think it would be concerning if uh, people are told to stay at home and only move home if it's essential or they can't, but large numbers of workers are, are forced to work outside. And finally, um, I, I am concerned about the issue um, of the university um, that, that was re- referred to. I mean, concern for multiple reasons because there's a real ratcheting up uh, of fines and regulation of, of people's individual uh, daily lives, but it seems to be universities can either act with impunity or act with limited uh, recourse uh, to their actions. And I think, for me, it's certainly, at the very least, uh, international students have been sold a pop where there won't be uh, face-to-face teaching, but they'll be stuck in, in halls for a long period of time, as, as has been referred to. So I, I'm just very, very concerned about that for those reasons. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Um, so, in terms of the ten-day self-isolation period reduction from fifteen, um, we in, in legislation it doesn't apply to anyone unless they've been outside of the common travel area. However, we have introduced guidance um, asking those from who have come to Northern Ireland from any of the UK regions or the south uh, to self-isolate when they come here if they're staying more than twenty-four hours, um, and that allows for. Uh, essential travel as a routine travel is permitted so those living in border areas wouldn't see either day-to-day lives impacted by that um and it, so it, whilst it's not in legislation i think of what i'm saying is it is in the guidance and we still do ask people to self-isolate given the, the transmission of disease at the moment um in terms of the evidence i'll i'll undertake to have a look and see if any of the evidence is is publicly available or what we can provide to committee members so i'm happy to take that away um, sectoral exemptions on the TV, um, I, I'm not familiar with what the other regions have in place and we can look that up, um, but I would say that this is only for high-end TV um, it, it is more or less in line with the film exemption that we already had in place uh, and, and it's, it, it is very much um, a smaller number than, than, than just all TV production. Um, the Department uh, of Culture, Media and Sport are responsible for this exemption, so they will be keeping a, a watch on, on the use of it. Um, and we will obviously be involved in those conversations and be working with them uh, to make sure that it's not being uh, exploited or overused. And uh, in terms of the university, um, I'm happy to take that one away as well, and we can look into uh, the, the situation. Okay, Jerry. Okay. Jerry. Um, okay. Moving on then, um, Orlea, please. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks, Elaine, for um, today's update. Um, I think it would actually be useful if the committee, even if it was in written form, if we could get um, some of that information um, around the, the scientific evidence on that decision to move the self-isolation from the, the 14 days down to the 10 days. That would be useful um, to know. And just in relation to the international travel, um, SR 326. Um, on page 99 um, of our packet, it refers to the words providing the definition of a, a new domestic elite um, sports person arriving into the north. And it talks about written evidence from um, a UK or an English sport national governing body. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, was there was there any um, was there any other sort of um, outreach to any of the Irish governing bodies, um, or was it a case of basically copy and paste from models that were, were being used in, in England? Because I'm thinking even about the likes of um, the Irish Rugby Football Union. Um, did, did we or did our Department of Health take any any evidence or guidance or advice um, from that, that governing body? And then just finally, also on the international travel, I know the Minister was saying this morning that it is still an issue. Um, it's unbelievable that we're still saying this so many months later, but that it is still with the doctrine of the passenger locator forms coming from um, north to south or south to north. Um, and I'm just wondering then, outside of that, and I hope that problem is rectified um, really soon, um, but ha- have, ha- has our Department of Health been um, monitoring how many people have been coming in internationally? You know, do we have like the figures of those? and? 
do we have the figures of how many people have received, um, you know, like even telephone follow-up calls to see if they're carrying out the, the isolation? Thank you, Lillian. Uh, thanks, Rilea. So, um, in terms of the sports exemptions, so in West De Department of Culture, Media and Sport laid on the, the sectoral exemption or the sports exemption generally, once we get any changes that they want to make to that through, we send them to the sports leads in Department for Communities and they then undertake any engagements that's needed and they also will tell us if there's any Northern Ireland specific events that need to be added that haven't been considered by any of the other regions. Um, so whilst Department of Health doesn't directly speak to the governing bodies, there is a process there for that information to be checked and to make sure that the regulations that we have here are appropriate for us. Um, they could also advise that they don't need specific events, although, uh, you know, and, and not list them, although we're, we're less concerned about that because if we haven't, if we have too many events almost, it's better than not, have, than not having missed one um, because it's unlikely for most of the GB events anyway that there'll be transiting people coming through Northern Ireland. Um, but it just means that it does give that cover just in case that were, were to happen. Um, in terms of information sharing, yes, uh, I, I agree. It, it, it is something I would really have loved to have seen resolved by now, long before now. Um, in terms of the data that we have for international arrivals, so we have data on the number of people who complete passenger locator forms and put down a Northern Ireland based address and we get that weekly and it helps us keep a handle on the numbers that are coming in. Um, we don't get it broken down by country, we just get the total number um, and we get information as to whether they have declared themselves exempt from self-isolation or not. Um, but again, we don't know the reason for the, them declaring the self-isolation, we just know that they've said that they have been, that they are exempt and that could be perhaps because of the country they've come from rather than necessarily their job. Uh, so um, we get that data. We also get data on the number of calls that are made to Northern Ireland landlines. Um, the, the numbers on that are quite low and it, it could be misconstrued that that means that not very many people from Northern Ireland are getting called. But actually in reality, the vast majority of people put mobile numbers down on their passenger locator form and we can't tell where the mobile numbers are from. So public health agency, public health in contractor that makes the calls only gets the essential data that they need to contact the person um, for data protection reasons and that doesn't include the address so we can't verify that way if the person who has been telephoned lives in Northern Ireland which makes it very difficult to be sure the exact number of people who get follow-up calls here um, but we do know that they do happen and it is ongoing and we are part of the sampling same sampling process that England, that England um, is involved with. Can I just come back in? Yes, go ahead, um, Arlene. Arlene, th thanks very much. That's, that's really useful um, information. I'm, I'm just wondering, because I know that issue around the, the landline numbers, um, again, this was something that was spoke about many months ago at Health Committee, and I know that there was issues there. Um, so see around the, the mobile numbers, because well, so I'm assuming then, even if someone's putting down a mobile, phone number that they are getting the call, no matter where, where they're receiving the call with the advice that they need to be isolating. Um, and is, is, there, is there no way that, you know, there could, there could be some sort of a system put in place where, uh, you know, between our Department of Health here and between, you know, the, the, the agencies that are carrying out the, the, the phone calls, is there no system that could be put in place where they could be Thank no way to, do you know what I mean, to, to track if it is a someone from the north, because I think it's important that we have we have that data, you know. Yeah, um, no, it, it would be really useful to have that data actually, um, and all we can really do, which we do periodically rather than regularly, um, is just get a proxy number use the, using the basis of the number of people called the number of people in England and Northern Ireland who give mobile numbers versus the number that give landlines and try to try to do a proxy calculation as to roughly how many people are likely to have been called. Um, but as you say, it's not it's not giving you that kind of data. Um, the main issue is really around data protection and the fact that we can't and we shouldn't give the contractor more data than they need. And all they really need to contact a person with a mobile number. Um, so they wouldn't really have a reason either to ask the person where, where they were. Um, other than for data collection purposes, which doesn't really um, give us enough in data protection terms for that captured at that point. Uh, so the only thing that could be done would be like matching the data back to the full data set once the call took place. 
um, but that would be quite um, onerous on, on, on the system and we would need to build some, some digital solutions into that. And given that this would only be a small part of the big work that's ongoing, that there's a lot of um, technology capability absorbed within regular reviews of the passenger locator form, for example, so it would detract away from some of that work and it would not be one of the higher priorities at this point, but perhaps in the future we'll get we'll get some type of downtime and they'll be able to look at things like that. Yeah, see, because even though even if um Elaine, you know, like there could be, you know, a small footnote at the bottom of the, the forms where if someone is from the north that that, you know, they could maybe proactively even ring a number here locally just to confirm that they've went through that process. And I know not everyone will do it, yeah. but even if there was reference to it on the form, it might help the, the department with that with that data. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, that's that's something we could actually look at. Is sort of how could we make it more, more proactive, where the person themselves um, self identifies as if they put in a mobile number, self identifies as being a Northern Ireland um, resident in some way. And um, we can have a have a discussion certainly with uh, the Bureau Force team that manages the PLF and see if something could be done on that. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And finally, um, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Elaine, once again. Well, Elaine has asked most of my questions. I was really going to ask around, you know, how those who are not compliant with self-isolation period are detected. And I wanted to ask, um, for example, um, for someone to simply not fill out the travel locator form um, with recourse for the authorities. So is that is that possible? And is that happening, that, that some of these... Um, Locator forms are simply not filled in. Um, yes, it, it is happening, Pam, and most most like most of the times that it, it happens, I imagine it's through Dublin. Um, that we have strengthened measures in border force for arrivals direct into the UK recently, and there's an enhanced enforcement protocol in place now, um, and that has led to an increase um, in both compliance but also in fixed penalty notices that are issued uh, for those that haven't complied. Um, and that's in line with kind of just the strengthening of the enforcement position generally, which it was described in one of the regulation changes that we made um, in December. Uh, so it, it, in terms of the those that don't complete a form and enforcement of self-isolation, yes, that is still happening. Um, PSNI get referrals not just from Border Force, but they get them for, for members of the public who are concerned about those that they know have travelled and aren't self-isolating. They could PS and I have issued fixed penalty notices and continue to do so, where regardless of whether the person has issued a, or completed a passenger locator form, um, PS and I can issue the fixed penalty notice without a form having been completed. Okay, and I suppose Elaine, that that really does actually bring up the importance of um, the public making these reports. It, it, it is actually very important that the public do make. I mean, a lot of us don't like it and don't like the idea of you touting on your neighbours and this type of thing, but actually, in terms of um, safety, it is actually important. Okay. Okay, Pam, is that you? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, any other members? No? Okay, well, listen, um, Elaine, thank you so much for your um, attendance at committee today. Again, very, very useful. A lot of answers, um, quest, um, questions answered there that we've all been pondering. So just w want to um, wish you well in your work going forward and to say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we're now going to consider each of the SRs in turn, um, starting with SR 2020 slash 325. This SR amends the information to be provided by operators to passengers to advise that the self-isolation period is reduced from 14 to 10 days. The rule also adds a reasonable defence clause for operators relating to an amended, uh, sorry, to any amended information to be provided to passengers if it was not reasonably pra um, practicable to do so. Have members any issues they'd like to raise in connection with this statutory rule? Okay, if not, members. Um, can ask, can we formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020-325, the Health Protection Coronavirus Health Public Health Advice for Passengers Travelling to Northern Ireland, Number 2 Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Okay. Chair. Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead, Jerry. That's right, Chair. I've raised my hand right before you move on. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but what's the final date we have to make a, a, an assessment on this? Because I do think it's quite concerning that we're being told to um, 
are asked to accept this. Um, we haven't got the, the medical or scientific rationale for the reduction in the isolation period. So what, what's the final date we have to in the conclusion on this? Okay, apologies, um, Jerry. I thought that was your hand still raised from the from your no other question. Okay. Apologies there. I'll just just check with the committee clerk. So these three travel uh, re related regulations are by negative resolution, and the end of the statutory period for this first one is the second of February. So the twenty first of January would be the last opportunity for the committee to agree to object to it, and therefore seek to lay a motion to annul and um, but of course a lot of these there are various things caught up within them in, in addition to the 10 days the the of course the reduction of 14 to 10 days in this regulation is reflecting wider decisions in other regulations um, so uh, there, there's, there's wider implications on this particular regulation to be borne in mind does that answer your question Jerry uh, yeah, a bit. Um, thanks, Eilish. Um, I'm just thinking, can, can we hold off um, making a final decision next week and then giving the, the rationale, the scientific rationale to the committee, uh, Chair? Is that, is that an option for us to consider? Yeah, we, we could defer it if, if other members are content to wait. No. It d depends on the additional information okay. that we that we would receive. Like, you know, is there an indication that that will really change? This is across the board, this 10 to 14. It's not just happening in Northern Ireland. It's, it's UK-wide. In fact, maybe beyond that. So I think, we, you know, are we just deferring something that's not going to change anyway? Well, I suppose, um, I, would, I think we would content, I, I think people in terms of our scrutiny role, that they had all the information in front of them. So I'm, I'm happy to propose it. Sorry, Jerry, do you want to propose that we defer then? Yeah, sure. If we can, if I, if I can do that, um, and we uh, take from the, the information uh, that is uh, informing the decision, and then it may well be the same decision that people were intending to make today. But I think, as you said, it's important everybody and everybody in the committee has all information in front of them before they before they do so. So I'm happy to propose that, sure. Okay. Um. Thank you, Jerry. Have we got somebody to support that? Sure, just just on that, that recommendation, is that a provision that we have asked for additional information to come to us, or there already is additional information in the public domain? Well, I think it was the information that um, we were at, we asked for today that we were going to get back. Is my understanding? I, I just wasn't quite sure from the presentation from Elaine that that was going to be forthcoming in terms of in general, the time scale in terms of general scientific evidence to to support this decision. Um, the, the suggestion from the official was that, that the chief scientific advisor was best placed to advise on the wider rationale um, and Four Nations approach to the mm. self-isolation being reduced from 14 days to 10 days for those who were t had tested or who were contacts of, of cases, which was the, the background mm. to this particular travel-related outworking. Um, we're, and we're, we could, yeah. I have it in the notes of the meeting to pursue that with the department. Yeah, yeah no, my. Um, Conclusion to that, to that from from the advice was that the information was already in the public domain. It was just getting the chief scientific officer, who would be better placed to explain it. it. So, so what I'm trying to say is that the information that we have before us is going to be the same, only it's going to be a, potentially a different person explaining it. Is that that was my understanding? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to make judgment on that, but I'm certainly happy to get whatever information we can and send it to members, whether it's in the public domain or from the department or both. Okay. So. Um, well, I suppose we've still got time to defer it for a week, and I, I do take the point that there is wider information out there in the public domain. But I think just for the purposes of full scrutiny here at committee, and, and just to have that to hand would be would be useful. I'm conscious, that, therefore, then that the next SR also relates to this. Yeah. Um, I'll just I'll just go through. I'll just remind members what the SR 2020 slash 326. Um, seeks to amend the self-isolation period from 14 to 10 days as additional exemptions for certain workers and elite spokes, sorry, sports persons, gives effect to the enforcement of fixed penalty notices, adds Botswana and Saudi Arabia to the list of countries and territories in respect of which travellers are exempt from the requirement to self-isolate for 10 days after arrival in Northern Ireland and removes Canary Islands from that list. So. Um, Jerry, do you have or any members have you any other um, issues you wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? Uh, 
Um, just can I just bring the clerk in? If if we defer that first one, are we then possibly then required to defer the second? Not required, but there would be a logical a logical yes yeah, uh, reason to do so. So are our members prepared um, prepare to to um, defer this one as well um, to next week, pending to take into the decision, pending that additional information and advice from the chief scientific advisor. Yes. Okay. Okay, and then um, we noted that. Um, okay, so statute rule twenty twenty slash three four four. This removed Namibia, um, Uruguay, and the U.S. Virgin Islands from the list of countries and territories in respect of which travellers are exempt from the requirement to self isolate for ten days after arrival in Northern Ireland. So, um, have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? And again, would that be subject to deferral then? No. I don't. This one is separate. It doesn't relate to the ten days. It's just adding to the list of countries okay. in respect of which various rules apply. Okay. Okay. So, um, are, are um, members content with that? Yeah. Okay. So, if, if not, if not, can members formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020/344, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 26 Regulations Northern Ireland, and has no objection to this rule? Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, moving quickly on then, um, we're the um, item number tab 14 of your pack um, relates to SL1, the Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. The Department advises that it proposes to make a statutory rule to amend existing regulations to maintain parity with England and Wales by providing for an increase in the Healthy Start voucher scheme value from Three, um, three points ten to four points twenty five from April twenty twenty one. The department further advises that no public consultation has been held, as there are no changes to the core policy int intention, which is that pregnant women, new mothers, and children aged under four from lower income families continue to receive nutritional support from the Healthy Start scheme. The financial cost will be subsumed within the existing demand led budget. Do members have any issues they wish to raise? No. no I'm just okay. Welcome Okay. Thank you. So, is the committee content that the department makes the statutory rule? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, members, um, tab 15 of your pack um, relates to the January monitoring round. May I remind members that, due to time pressures, the committee did not receive a departmental briefing on January monitoring, and instead requested that the department provide the committee with a uh, written briefing. Okay. Um, you will recall, members, that we um, were previ previously advised of potential shortfall in trust budgets and challenging savings targets. Whereas now, due to the pandemic, the department is in the unusual situation of having underspends, resulting in the return of around 90 million to the centre. I note that while emphasising the fluid nature of the situation, the paper also outlines ongoing COVID-related finan financial pressures, but expects current resources to be sufficient. Do members have any comments to make on the um, information we received from the department, the briefing? Okay, Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, no, thanks, Chair. And I do note with no physical presentation, which is probably something that would have been very helpful in, in this regard. But I suppose probably a, a question that I would have had that perhaps we could put it to them by another way. Uh, that do the officials recognise that the public perception of the Department of Health surrendering millions of pounds of resource funding at a time when our hospitals are breaking point will not be a favourable one. I think that's something that deserves further scrutiny. Uh, I also would like to know why this, why couldn't this underspend be used to find novel ways to invest in, in skills and retraining uh, to boost health and, and social care staff numbers. So those are some technical questions, uh, you know, and, and from reading the, the briefing that I suppose it would have been good to okay. hear from a department official. Okay. Well, well. We'll, we'll note those queries, but just to be advised that the next oral briefing on the budget is expected in mid-February. So I suppose so an opportunity. Yeah, there will be an opportunity coming forward. Um, any any other um, members? Um, are, are, sorry, are you content for us to forward your queries? Yes, I'm yes. content with that. Yes. Okay. Any other members indicating to? Oh, um, I'll just bring in. Yeah, um, chair. Sorry, sorry um, I, I think Jerry. I just spotted Jerry's hand going up before you there, Pam. Jerry, do you want to come in, please? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm still at odds, Chair. Hopefully, you or, or somebody can uh, help me. The, the 15 million to 25 million um, uh, 
figure that the trusts were expected uh, to uh, re- reduce from their their budgets. Um, there's kind of a lot of language used uh, around that, um, and, and I'm not clear whether that re- requirement is not um, <clears throat> sorry the necessity for that requirement uh, still exists to make that 15 uh, to 25 million reduction or whether it's been put uh, to next year. So can we just get a bit more clarity uh, on that? Because the briefing didn't really give me much clarity on that issue. Um, thanks. OK, we can add that to the letter, but I would also highlight that we have three of the trusts coming next week, so um, we can be asking them some issues around their financial pressures. But um, Pam, would you like to come in, please? Yeah, thanks, Chair. No, I just um, on the back of those comments, if we're asking the department questions, can we ask if the if the budget rules are preventing uh, the reallocation of monies to other pressures? Because I think it's important to, to know that because we don't want to see a huge amount of monies going back, uh, especially in the middle of this um, crisis. Okay, um, the clerk has made a note of your of your questions there and your your comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, any other members? No. Okay, we're moving through the agenda nice and quickly today. Um, I'm turning now to um, tab 16 of the pack relating to correspondence members. Um, and there is a correspondence memo, memo at tab 16.1. Um, obviously, there's a lot of correspondence came in over the Christmas period, um, but I do want to um, draw members' attention to one item, and that is item t- um, 16.1. Um, 26 is the November monitoring round for the children's social care coronavirus temporary modification of children's social care regulations Northern Ireland 2020. We have considered this on a number of um, occasions. Have members any proposals or comments to make in relation to this? Okay, so are members content to note? Content to note, but again, probably questions for for officials in relation to it, and I suppose why I would thank them for the the detailed report. It does highlight the ongoing challenges that the sector is facing. But probably a question which I would have put to them. I, I don't know if this is the appropriate means of doing so, or will there be an opportunity uh, to address them directly. But I would be asking, how do staff and absence rates in children's social care currently compare with previous months? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what is the protocol if a foster care care has to self isolate or becomes ill? Uh, what have or what have been the main barriers to con- uh, to conducing reviews of care's leavers pathways in a timely way? Is there an age bracket of those affected? These are some of the questions that I, I would have if if it could be passed on through the the clerk or uh, indeed maybe we might have another opportunity to raise them. Um, thank you, Jonathan. I'll just check with the clerk. Uh, have we got another briefing lined up? We haven't lined up another briefing. Um, uh, happy certainly, to we can we can forward those in writing yeah. to allow your agenda time to be used for your. Of course, yeah, briefing. that's that's perfect. Okay, um, Jonathan. Just there was quite a number there. Um, yeah, I can you, forward them, please. Yeah. If we could, Elish, that that would be fantastic. Okay, have members any comments or proposals in relation to any other items of correspondence? Chair, Go ahead, Pam. just on, um, I did have my hand up there, it was just to, to back Johnny's questions there around that last item, and I would want to add to that as well, but I can also forward the questions I was wanting to, really to ask officials to explain why um, it's the case that remote visits to children's homes seem to have increased, but those um, to look after children have decreased, uh, so I'm concerned about the health and safety concern. Um, and. You know, are we sure that children in those group settings are not being disadvantaged? But I'll, I'll also forward that as well um, to the clerk so that she can add that to Johnny's questions, if that's okay. Um, thank you, Pam. I, I suppose um, just to, to all members, then it would be useful if anybody can forward any um, queries or questions um, through the committee clerk. Um, obviously, we had a lot to get through this week, and it's been very busy since we've all come back after Christmas. So, if people take an opportunity in the next couple of days to send stuff through to Eilish, so we can have a comprehensive um, letter to, to be forwarded on. Okay, um, I, I just had one issue, and it was just more just to, to welcome the correspondence that the um, minister sent in relation to that dying with Nick dignity, the private members' bill in the Iraqis. So. I just wanted to, to thank. It was quite a comprehensive, and it was very much appreciated. Okay, um, members. Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, apologies. Can, can, Pat, can Pat, I come in on, on one uh, matter of correspondence? Please do. Uh, sorry, if you just bear with me, I'll tell you exactly which one it is. It's uh, sixteen point two five, and I'm 
using it, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, as a hook because I've had correspondence from a GP whose daughter is an events manager in uh, the Ulster Hall and uh, the waterfront and is used to handling large numbers of people. And when she applied to give support, she's on furlough at the minute, when she applied to give support to the vaccination programme, she was immediately rejected because she doesn't come from a science background. And I'm wondering, would it be possible to write to the department and ask them uh, why uh, people who are involved in that type of work would be rejected, given that if we're going to have large scale vaccination, we're going to have people who uh, have experience in handling large numbers of people. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Pat. And I think um, that's, that we can also ask that question of Patricia Donnelly next week at committee around those logistical issues and the, the wider support base that the um, the vaccinators are, are to receive. So thank you. Any other? Okay. Okay, apologies. Um, Pat, just to confirm, are we writing to the department or are we going to wait until um, Patricia comes next week in relation to that query? Um, I just think we would be worthwhile writing to the department. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what role Patricia Donnelly would have in that recruitment process. Um, so ra rather than just waiting, I think it would be better to write, if that's OK but, with the committee. No, I think I think that's sensible. I, I do um, recognise the distinction, actually, in terms of that recruitment process. Thank you, Pat. Chair. OK, Pam, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. It's just to, to back what Pat's saying there. I think uh, he's making a very good point, and I think, as well as that, um, it also raises concerns around the whole workforce appeal and the very small number of successful applicants out of that. And it just strikes me that, you know, we haven't had an awful lot of successful um, applicants, as in people put in place from. A, uh, coming out of that workforce appeal and it, it also strikes me that given last week's events at uh, certain hospitals where trusts were putting out calls for clinicians and staff just basically to turn up at hospital they were so desperate and i know that there, there have been other calls for staff to come uh, and work any hours any hours that they're available to do so where it seemed to be with the workforce appeal they were being quite picky about um, what hours were required and, and needed and now we're in a, a des desperate scenario where we're asking existing staff to simply turn up and work anything they are prepared to work because we're, we're so short. I just think that there are questions around the workforce appeal and whether that's been handled correctly and whether they've actually utilised the amount of experience that's out there that, that, that is willing to come back and help. So I don't know if we can combine that uh, in correspondence to the department to, to raise our concerns. No, no, I think um, to make sure that we use all you know avenues of of resource that we can. Yeah. No, I know. Totally agree. Totally agree. I think I think you've raised some really good points there, Pam, and I, I think we could put that into a letter then to the department. Okay, Thank members. You. Thank you. Okay, turning um, now to the forward work program, and I refer members to tab sixteen point one of the pack. Um, as I said, we, we've next week we have got um, first of all um, briefing from three of the health trusts on their COVID response, and they are Belfast, Northern, and Southern Health and Social Care trusts. And then we have a departmental briefing on the COVID vaccination program. Okay, so um, the the rest of the four work programs there in the pack are members um, content to note. Agreed. Okay, thank you. So, any other business members? Okay. Um, so I'm just ch check on the phone. Um, Pam and Pat, have you come in under any other business? No. No, sorry, that Pam was up from before. Thank okay, because I keep missing them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just come to you, Jonathan, then, please. Thank you, Chair, and apologies I haven't given prior notice to, to this one, but it is an issue of serious concern. Uh, members will be aware that the Minister announced a public inquiry into Dr Aidan O'Brien within the Southern Trust. Um, since that announcement, I personally have become very concerned surrounding the evidence motivation and indeed the rationale behind that decision. I would like to propose that the committee receive evidence from the relevant uh, departmental official surrounding this case. It is important that this committee establish the facts which led to this decision, which will have huge financial ramifications, but also indeed 
personal ramifications for those involved. Okay. Okay, thank you. Or, well, do you get a note of that? I, I'm afraid I was dealing with another matter there, so I haven't got it, but I'll, I'll catch it. So, so what I would like to propose is that the committee receive evidence from uh, the relevant department official surrounding the case to move towards a public inquiry. The evidence provided, because it's important that the committee establish the facts surrounding the case and its decision to move towards a public inquiry. Thanks. Okay, I think um, Cara has seconded that, but absolutely, I think that it's probably one of those issues that we haven't really dug deep into as a committee because we've had so much of the COVID stuff. So no, definitely. I'm just, um, Jerry, are you wanting to come in? Yeah, thanks, Curtis. It's just a, a separate issue. Um, I mean, obviously, people will have seen the uh, the news in the south yesterday with a mother and baby um, report of you know tragic numbers of people neglected and nine thousand children dying um, in the in the home. So, I think it, it it points to the renewed effort of the review and people who are affected by um, those homes in the north to, to kind of get the answers they deserve. So I think it was it was important just to just to note that, uh, given the, the news um, in the south yesterday. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Alan? Yes, thanks, Chair. It's just, just I got this email in just before coming into the meeting this morning, Chair. Uh, it's from uh, a lady who represents a, a small group. Uh, I think they've only about 17 members at the moment who are suffering from this uh, long COVID um, and they've all listed their, their ages and their jobs and their, their symptoms and a lot of similarities in, in terms of symptoms. But um, she's saying that uh, Northern Ireland urgently needs centres to uh, that adopt a multidisciplinary approach uh, in an integrated manner to ensure patients like us receive the best the correct treatment and rehabilitation services. And the model is currently in operation in England with over 60 NHS sites providing um, tailored support to patients and in America health uh, system leaders have introduced uh, care centres for COVID-19 uh, long uh, callers uh, who will experience uh, symptoms and side effects. Um, just to take advice from the clerk, uh, should I just forward this to the committee for the go on our correspondence list? I'm, I'm advised it's in next week's pack. So, yes. so you'll all get it, so it'll be on the agenda for next week. Okay. Okay, thank you. But I, I would just come back on that. I, I asked the health minister just before Christmas, and he advised that CMO was actually working on the long COVID plan. So I wonder, could we ask for an update on on that work of the CMO? Of Is that okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Pat, are you wishing to come in under any other business? No, Chair, no. Okay, thank, thank you. I, I saw your hand up there. I so say, keep getting. Uh, from earlier in. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, John. Sure. I, I, another issue which I'm sure members will be aware of, we didn't get a chance because of the time limitations with the Minister to raise this, but it, it has come to the attention that, in relation to organ donation, that we have seen the, the destruction or disposal of uh, donor organs throughout the COVID 19 period uh, with the inability for those services to, to be used. I think this should come as quite a shock and worry and alarm to, to many members, given how uh, some of these organs, there's a significant waiting list for their use, which affect a lot of patients. So I think would it be useful for the committee to ascertain from the department how many such organs, both living organs and indeed deceased donor organs, uh, have had to be unfortunately disposed of uh, during this period of time? It's just uh, something I would like a wee bit of clarity on from the department as to if that has happened. I'm just. I'll bring in a second. Alan. Is that something for a, a written question, or is that something that we, as a committee, would usually? You can progress it either by your own written question or via the committee as a letter from the committee. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I, I felt it was a concern that okay. the committee would all have. Uh, you right. know, it's just, more of it's information that I think we, we we should have as to ascertain the facts is is important. Okay, no problem. Sure, just to, to draw the committee's attention. Uh, there was a statement put out last night, and I certainly uh, saw it myself on television, uh, where there was a, a clear statement that no organs had been disposed or destroyed within Northern Ireland during this period. So I think we need to be careful. Just you know, we can ask the question, but I think they have put the answer out there. I don't think it's correct that any organs have been disposed, okay. or destroyed. I, I, and I would hate to think that they yeah. were. Oh, I agree. And just on the back of balance, I think the wording of the statement from the department was living organ. 
uh, as opposed to deceased donor organs that have had to be unfortunately disposed of. So I think it would concern members if that was the case. So uh, providing the, the detail would be important. Okay, well I'm not across all the detail too. So yeah, we can we can seek clarity on that on that. Okay, thank you and thank you both for, for your contributions in that regard. Okay, so I'm assuming there's no other um, business to be raised at this um, stage. We'll move on then to date, time and place of next meeting. Members, before we uh, move into closed session to continue our consideration of evidence uh, on the care homes inquiry, I would advise that our next meeting will be on Thursday, the 21st of January at 9.30 a.m. in the Senate Chamber, when we will have uh, briefings from the Trust, as I said, and an update on the vaccination programme. Okay, thank you very much. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.